arrived the new woman's party by donald wilhelm from the green book magazine volume twenty three nineteen twenty the story of a militant quakeress and the other interesting women who are winning their fight why has thee been arrested alice why has thee been sent to jail for seven months the answer is of course the national woman's party but how and what the militant quakeress the modern susan b anthony answered the little quaker mother in moorestown new jersey we do not know we know only that she wrote in friendly spirit with its thee and thou and thine and we may conjecture that in friendly phrase she wrote what she had wired a southern state chairman of her party who was very 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 discouraged we can we shall make them see it because it is so right and she this girl body of a woman did gloriously what with jail sentences for herself and nearly three hundred other really valorous women make them see it the whole gusty crew of em including perhaps you and me see it the light and justice in the ascendancy of women from the political plight of vegetables to the majesty of citizenship and the vote to do that alice paul established the first women's party in all history a party unique quite in that it had and has a platform that it stands on sleeps on argues on preys on fights on a platform with only one plank a straight and narrow one the enfranchisement of women by federal action it put up no candidates on that one straight and narrow plank there was no room indeed that plank was so imperiously rigorous that for want of room many a man walked it to political oblivion but it was a wieldy and right merrily manipulated plank withal considering that slivers from it blinded many a bad man's eye considering that it was employed even though the figure hurts a little to chastise the president but first lest we quite misjudge the physical prowess of this militant quakeress she who was jostled and jerked and jailed starved and generally bedeviled by the blue-coated minions of old john prejudice the arbiter of creation let it be said that she had no love for six years of prejudice and his processes albeit she is a doctor of philosophy a ph d if you will she hated such war especially at the white house gates but she was not a whit too proud to fight for the same grand old cause we were fighting for in europe certain inalienable rights etc etc she her shock troops and wanting such masterly strategy as we shall explain further on defeated the president and two great political parties not because they wanted to but necessarily because as she told me political parties give just what they have to give act and they act pause they relax to show you the president finally said he was for suffrage then he relaxed we said that wasn't enough then he went to congress and addressed the senate we told him that wasn't enough he began to write to voters to send back men in favor of suffrage but that wasn't enough for we knew he could if he would do vastly more he began to cable them from abroad so we met him at the pier in boston but that was by no means all of the strategy employed as we shall see in the rule laid down by the militant quakeress that no party should enjoy peace lest it call all women sister so let us put our binoculars on her and if we quite properly can get her into focus look at her and her motives over across and through behold then no haggard fury with dishevelled hair to the contrary a rather small feminine figure in her young thirties a girl woman of an adaptive physically fine-drawn type who is quiet modest reticent whom we find sitting in a large room all white and purple and gold the tints of the tricolor resting easily and interestingly in a large purple chair a trim and alert girlish figure in white with a purple scarf mantling her slight shoulders she is clearly of mental and spiritual rather than of physical strength and if you are a wise old owl you see a lot to interest you in her rather triangular face in the wide smooth frank and fearless brow 
the sensitive sturdy nose and pointed chin in the eyes that you are pleasurably surprised to find are nearer blue than gray in their meditative and questioning scrutiny well you conclude she is interesting isn't she but why oh why did she do it why oh why why she would repeat with a lurking and quizzical sense of mischief and amusement why because it had to be done aha opportunist you tell your other self but again quite to the contrary quakerous to be sure and quakers are not all prayerful moreover the quakers are raised to believe in sex equality susan b anthony was one and alice paul did much to finish with what she began miss paul was sent to a private school early then she went to swarthmore college confident that co-education need not be the thief of time and was graduated in nineteen o five aged twenty the next year she spent at the college settlement in new york city a settlement worker and a student at the school of philanthropy the year following nineteen o seven she got her master's degree at the university of pennsylvania in nineteen o seven to nineteen o eight she studied and worked in the woodbrook school of social work in birmingham england and applied herself vigorously to the study of sociology and economics at the university of birmingham the year nineteen o eight to nineteen o nine she gave to a postgraduate work in the school of economics of the university of london while carrying on her college studies she worked for one winter at the summerlank settlement in birmingham and assisted the charity organization society in london for half a year she was assistant secretary of one of the districts of the london charity organization society another half year she gave to the peel institute for social work in the tenement house district of london another summer she lived and worked in the hoxton street settlement and for another period in the canning town settlement then she returned to america to do more charity organization to america drafted the suffrage amendment in new york city and to take her doctor's degree at the university of pennsylvania all through these years especially in england she was gradually coming to realize that the interests of womankind were her pre-eminent interests it was no wonder therefore that she proceeded to lend her help to the national american woman suffrage association which for years faithfully and steadily had been working to achieve in the separate states legislation to afford women enfranchisement she was made chairman of its legislative committee sent to washington soon to gleam there as no uncertain light we must get the picture the year nineteen thirteen rolling round and this girl aged twenty eight almost unknown hiring a room in washington to go therefrom to conquer a nation and soon to lose the support even of the conservative organization that had sent her when we came here in nineteen thirteen she explained when at last i got to her and induced her to tell me the story congress had simply not heard of suffrage as a national issue suffrage had not been reported out of committee or been talked about in either the house or senate for over twenty years it had never been voted on neither president nor the great political parties ever mentioned suffrage clearly if we kept on this way we young women would be old women before enfranchisement would come if on the other hand we turned to the federal amendment instead of awaiting action by the states to concentrate the forces of suffrage on congress and the president probably we could force action the national woman's party it was the congressional union then was short of funds in the campaign of nineteen sixteen for instance it had only five thousand dollars to spend in a campaign against two great parties but specifically against the democratic party which had of course hundreds of thousands of dollars and traditions personnel organizations down to the last state and the last precinct in that state it was short too of workers but women and some men came forward some to make great personal sacrifices to follow the leadership of this girl the youngest political leader by the way and one of the very ablest in our national life her good judgment and that of her associates determined them to accept facts as they found them it was recognized that ours is a party government so when the congressional elections came in the autumn of nineteen fourteen 
and the suffrage amendment was still disregarded in washington despite its shortage of personnel and of funds the woman's party instituted a campaign of attack in suffrage states on the party in power the democratic party and appeal was made to women voters there to vote for the defeat of the party the democratic party which while in power that is in control of the committees and of the caucus that controlled committees in congress had used its power and position to obstruct the enfranchisement of all women the hard logic of party government was applied in other words by the woman's party it served notice to this effect on the democratic party from the president down and to all its candidates cooperate put the suffrage amendment through or we'll rally all our strength against you all along the line no matter what individually you say or do in nineteen fifteen the appeal to the women voters in states that had suffrage was carried further the first national convention of women voters was the result in san francisco during the panama pacific exposition from this convention envoys were sent across the country to washington to present to the president and congress the demand for national enfranchisement of women immediately thereafter the president announced his conversion to the principles of equal suffrage by the state method but not by the national method which was not enough consequently in the following spring in chicago another great convention of voting women was held in that convention women organized to fight president wilson and all democratic candidates for office just as long as the president and his party opposed the suffrage amendment as a result of this convention or at least as a result of the determination that the women displayed suffrage planks were spiked down for the first time in our history in the national presidential platforms of all the political parties for the campaign of nineteen sixteen but when the administration and congress settled down to work after the november elections suffrage still had no place on the legislative program and president wilson explained that fact by explaining that he was the servant of the party whose platform he was known to have dictated and that he could not exceed the state suffrage plank in that platform which he himself was acknowledged to have written it was then that the shock troops of miss paul debauched on the white house as well as on congress once more and there through cold and stormy weather despite arrest and imprisonment despite ridicule and every shaft and weapon that could be summoned against them they stayed substantially all the time till the amendment was passed but it would be entirely superficial to suppose that miss paul trusted wholly to such a frontal attack not at all successful though that was she delegated to miss maud younger and her corps of lobbyists the task of completing and perfecting a card index a kind of rogues gallery in which were recorded the results of all manner of searching inquiry about and interviews with the president the two ex-presidents every member of congress and the senate and about every one else who coming or going might have had or had or might have any relation to suffrage as far as any one knows this was the first achievement of its scope and kind ever carried out it was like g two general pershing's vast intelligence system at general head amved something quarters closely related was the political committee with mrs abby scott baker as chairman to which was entrusted the winning over by personal interviews of all manner of groups or collections of men or women who were known to have influence with senators or representatives especially those senators or representatives who were listed as doubtful or black in the rogues gallery presided over by miss younger and closely related likewise was the organization and legislative committee headed by miss doris stevens which extended its functions and is still extending them out from washington to the state organizations and down through them to the people or constituents in the members home states it was very very simple great corporations have been laying down organization lines like these for years with a central administrative bureau with its president or chairman of the board of directors its subsidiaries each charged with certain functions 
and it was and is very powerful but suppose we let the militant quakeress tell how it works in the case of a real live senator there is the case of senator blank now we call miss younger's card index organization our thermometer she gathers the information and finds out how the men stand also she deals directly through the lobby with the senators and representatives here in washington she reported that there was no hope of getting senator blank by direct action so the political committee was notified and mrs baker saw everyone who she thought could bring any influence to bear information therefore being supplied largely by miss younger to make a long and detailed story shorter at about the same time the legislative committee under miss stevens got to work then miss stevens went to the senator's state and in a trice to right of him to left of him down the line in front of him and in fact under him senator blank the suffragists were at work he submitted and modest miss paul naively remarks i do not mean to claim that what we did led him to change so you ask miss paul in behalf of this legislator if it isn't unfair for women thus to take advantage of a man how else she asks simply can women make their wants known when they haven't the vote then she adds while you ponder we think it is the duty of a congressman or a state legislator to represent the people in his vote instead of his own personal opinion by organization we seek first to organize opinion and crystallize it and then to bring it to bear this by the way is what all manner of organizations do though none of it do it better than that of the militant quakeress end of arrived the new women's party by donald wilhelm chattanooga by the encyclopedia britannica eleventh edition volume six slice one by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chattanooga by anonymous from the eleventh edition of the encyclopedia britannica Chattanooga, a city and the county seat of Hamilton County, Tennessee, USA, in the southeast part of the state, about 300 miles south of Cincinnati, Ohio, and 150 miles southeast of Nashville, Tennessee, on the Tennessee River, and near the boundary line between Tennessee and Georgia. Population, 1860, 2,545. 1870, 6,093. 1880, 12,892. 1890, 29,100. 1900, 30,154, of whom 994 were foreign born and 13,122 were Negroes. U.S. Census, 1910, 44,604. The city is served by the Alabama Great Southern, Queen and Crescent, the Cincinnati Southern, leased by the Cincinnati, New Orleans and Texas Pacific Railway Company, the Nashville, Chattanooga and St. Louis, controlled by the Louisville and Nashville, and its leased line, the Western and Atlantic, connecting with Atlanta, Georgia, the Central of Georgia, and the Chattanooga Southern Railways, and by freight and passenger steamboat lines on the Tennessee River, which is navigable to and beyond this point during eight months of the year. That branch of the Southern Railway, extending from Chattanooga to Memphis, was formerly the Memphis and Charleston, under which name it became famous in the American Civil War. Chattanooga occupies a picturesque site at a sharp bend of the river. To the south lies Lookout Mountain, whose summit, 2,126 feet above the sea, 1,495 feet above the river, commands a magnificent view. To the east rises Missionary Ridge. Fine driveways and electric lines connect with both Lookout Mountain, the summit of which is reached by an inclined plane on which cars are operated by eight cable, and Missionary Ridge, 
where there are federal reservations as well as with the national military park fifteen square miles dedicated eighteen ninety five on the battlefield of chickamauga q v this park was one of the principal mobilization camps of the united states army during the spanish-american war of eighteen ninety eight among the principal buildings are the city hall the federal building the county courthouse the public library the high school and the st vincent's and the baroness erlanger hospitals among chattanooga's educational institutions are two commercial colleges the chattanooga college for young ladies non-sectarian the chattanooga normal university and the university of chattanooga until nineteen o seven united states grant university whose preparatory department the athens school is at athens tennessee a co-educational institution under methodist episcopal control established in eighteen sixty seven it has a school of law eighteen ninety nine a medical school eighteen eighty nine and a school of theology eighteen eighty eight east of the city is a large national cemetery containing more than thirteen thousand graves of federal soldiers chattanooga is an important produce lumber coal and iron market and is the principal trade and jobbing center for a large district in eastern tennessee and northern georgia and alabama the proximity of coal fields and iron mines has made chattanooga an iron manufacturing place of importance its plants including car shops blast furnaces foundries agricultural implement and machinery works and stove factories the city has had an important part in the development of the iron and steel industries in this part of the south there are also flour mills tanneries united states leather company patent medicine furniture coffin wooden ware and wagon factories knitting and spinning mills planing mills and sash door and blind factories the lumber being obtained from logs floated down the river and by rail the value of the city's factory products increased from ten million five hundred and seventeen thousand eight hundred and eighty six dollars in nineteen hundred to fifteen million one hundred and ninety three thousand nine hundred and nine dollars in nineteen o five or forty four point five per cent chattanooga was first settled about eighteen thirty five and was long known as ross's landing it was incorporated in eighteen fifty one as chattanooga and received a city charter in eighteen sixty six its growth for the three decades after the civil war was very rapid during the american civil war it was one of the most important strategic points in the confederacy and in its immediate vicinity were fought two great battles during june eighteen sixty two it was threatened by a federal force under general o m mitchell but the confederate army of general braxton bragg was transferred thither by rail from corinth mississippi before mitchell was able to advance in september eighteen sixty three however general w s rosecrans with the union army of the cumberland outmaneuvered bragg concentrated his numerous columns in the chickamauga valley and occupied the town to which after the defeat of chickamauga q v he retired from the end of september to the twenty fourth of november the army of the cumberland was then invested in chattanooga by the confederates whose position lay along missionary ridge from its north end near the river towards rossville whence their entrenchments extended westwards to lookout mountain which dominates the whole ground the tennessee running directly beneath it thus rosecrans was confined to a semicircle of low ground around chattanooga itself and his supplies had to make a long and difficult detour from bridgeport the main road being under fire from the confederate position on lookout and in the wahatchee valley adjacent bragg indeed expected that rosecrans would be starved into retreat but the federals once more and this time on a far larger scale concentrated in the face of the enemy the eleventh and twelfth 
corps from virginia under hooker were transferred by rail to reinforce rosecrans other troops were called up from the mississippi and on the sixteenth of october the federal government reconstituted the western armies under the supreme command of general grant the fifteen corps of the army of the tennessee under sherman was on the march from the mississippi hooker's troops had already arrived when grant reached chattanooga on the twenty third of october the army of the cumberland was now under thomas rosecrans having been recalled the first action was fought at brown's ferry in the wahatchee valley where hooker executed with complete precision a plan for the revictualling of chattanooga established himself near wahatchee on the twenty eighth and repulsed a determined attack on the same night but sherman was still far distant and the federal forces at knoxville against which a large detachment of bragg's army under longstreet was now sent were in grave danger grant waited for sherman's four divisions but prepared everything for battle in the meantime his plan was that thomas in the chattanooga lines should contain the confederate center on missionary ridge while hooker on the right at wahatchee was to attack lookout mountain and sherman farther up the river was to carry out the decisive attack against bragg's extreme right wing at the end of missionary ridge the last marches of the fifteen corps were delayed by stormy weather bragg reinforced longstreet and telegraphic communication between grant and the federals at knoxville had already ceased but grant would not move forward without sherman and the battle of chattanooga was fought more than two months after chickamauga on the twenty third of november a forward move of thomas's army intended as a demonstration developed into a serious and successful action whereby the first line of the confederate center was driven in for some distance bragg was now much weakened by successive detachments having been sent to knoxville and on the twenty fourth the real battle began sherman's corps was gradually brought over the river near the mouth of chickamauga creek and formed up on the east side the attack began at one p m and was locally a complete success the heights attacked were in sherman's hands and fortified against counter-attack before nightfall hooker in the meanwhile had fought the battle above the clouds on the steep face of lookout mountain and though opposed by an equal force of confederates had completely driven the enemy from the mountain the twenty fourth then had been a day of success for the federals and the decisive attack of the three armies in concert was to take place on the twenty fifth but the maps deceived grant and sherman as they had previously deceived rosecrans sherman had captured not the north point of missionary ridge but a detached hill and a new and more serious action had to be fought for the possession of tunnel hill where bragg's right now lay strongly entrenched the confederates used every effort to hold the position and all sherman's efforts were made in vain hooker who was moving on rossville had not progressed far and bragg was still free to reinforce his right grant therefore directed thomas to move forward on the center to relieve the pressure on sherman the army of the cumberland was after all to strike the decisive blow about three thirty p m the center advanced on the confederates trenches at the foot of missionary ridge these were carried at the first rush and the troops were ordered to lie down and await orders then occurred one of the most dramatic episodes of the war suddenly and without orders either from grant or the officers at the front the whole line of the army of the cumberland rose and rushed up the ridge two successive lines of entrenchments were carried at once in a short time the crest was stormed and after a last attempt at resistance the enemy's center fled in the wildest confusion the pursuit was pressed home by the divisional generals notably by sheridan hooker now advanced in earnest on rossville and by nightfall the whole confederate army except the troops on tunnel hill were retreating in disorder these two were withdrawn in the night and the victory of the federals was complete bragg lost 
eight thousand six hundred and eighty four men killed wounded and prisoners out of perhaps thirty four thousand men engaged grant with sixty thousand men lost about six thousand end of chattanooga by anonymous from the encyclopedia britannica eleventh edition david hume by john watts this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite David Hume by John Watts Lord Brougham has rendered service not only to letters, but also to free thought by his admirable lives, incomparably the best we have of Voltaire, Rousseau, Hume, Gibbon, etc., from lord brougham we learn whose life in this sketch we follow that david hume related to the earl of hume's family was born in edinburgh in april seventeen eleven refusing to be made a lawyer he was sent in seventeen thirty four to a mercantile house in bristol the desk not suiting the embryo historian's genius we find him in seventeen thirty seven at la fleche in anjou writing his stillborn treatise on human nature which in seventeen forty two in separate essays attracted some notice keeper and companion to the marquis of annandale in seventeen forty five private secretary to general st clair in seventeen forty seven he visited on embassy the courts of vienna and turin while at turin he completed his inquiry concerning the human understanding and the treatise on human nature in a new form returned to scotland he published his political discourses in seventeen fifty two and the same year his inquiry concerning the principles of morals the essays moral and metaphysical are the form in which we now read these speculations in seventeen fifty two hume became librarian to the faculty of advocates in seventeen fifty four he published the first volume of his history of england in seventeen fifty five appeared his natural history of religion in seventeen sixty three he accompanied the british ambassador to paris in seventeen sixty five he became charge d'affaires in seventeen sixty six he was appointed under secretary of state under marshal conway in seventeen seventy five he was seized with a mortal disease which he bore without any abatement of his cheerfulness and on the twenty fifth of august le bon david as he was styled in paris died to use his own words having no enemies except all the whigs all the tories and all the christians which was something to his honour and a testimony to the usefulness of his life david hume was the first writer who gave historical distinction to great britain lord john russell remarked in a speech at bristol in october eighteen fifty four we have no other history of england than hume's when a young man of eighteen asks for a history of england there is no resource but to give him hume hume was the author of the modern doctrines of politics and political economy which now rule the world of science he was the sagacious unfolder of truth the accurate and bold discoverer of popular error more than a sceptic he was an atheist such is lord brougham's judgment of him hume carried free thought into high places in originality of thought grace of style and logical ability he distanced all rival writers on religion in his time and what is of no small importance his life was as blameless as his intellect was unapproachable our first extract from his writings is a felicitous statement of the pro and con on the questions of polygamous and single marriages a man in conjoining himself to a woman is bound to her according to the terms of his engagement in begetting children he is bound by all the ties of nature and humanity to provide for their subsistence and education when he has performed these two parts of duty no one can reproach him with injustice or injury 
and as the terms of his engagement, as well as the methods of subsisting his offspring, may be various, it is mere superstition to imagine that marriage can be entirely uniform, and will admit only of one mode or form. Did not human laws restrain the natural liberty of men, every particular marriage would be as different as contracts or bargains of any other kind or species. As circumstances vary and the laws propose different advantages, we find that in different times and places they impose different conditions on this important contract. In Tonquin it is unusual for the sailors, when the ship comes into the harbor, to marry for the season, and notwithstanding this precarious arrangement they are assured, it is said, of the strictest fidelity to their bed, as well as in the whole management of their affairs from those temporary spouses. I cannot at present recollect my authorities, but I have somewhere read that the Republic of Athens, having lost many of its citizens by war and pestilence, allowed every man to marry two wives in order the sooner to repair the waste which had been made by these calamities. The poet Euripides happens to be coupled to two noisy vixens, who so plagued him with their jealousies and quarrels that he became ever after a professed woman-hater and is the only theatrical writer, perhaps the only poet, that ever entertained an aversion to the sex. The advocates for polygamy may recommend it as the only effectual remedy for the disorders of love, and the only expedient for freeing men from that slavery to the females which the natural violence of our passions has imposed upon us. By this means alone we can regain our right of sovereignty, and, sating our appetite, re-establish the authority of reason in our minds, and, of consequence, our own authority in our families. Man, like a weak sovereign, being unable to support himself against the wiles and intrigues of his subjects, must play one faction against the other, and become absolute by the mutual jealousy of the females. To divide and to govern is a universal maxim, and by neglecting it the Europeans undergo a more grievous and a more ignominious slavery than the Turks or Persians, who are subjected indeed to a sovereign that lies at a distance from them, but in their domestic affairs rules with an uncontrollable sway. On the other hand, it may be urged with better reason that this sovereignty of the male is a real usurpation and destroys that nearness of rank, not to say equality, which nature has established between the sexes. We are by nature their lovers, their friends, their patrons. Would we willingly exchange such endearing appellations for the barbarous title of master and tyrant? In what capacity shall we gain by this inhuman proceeding? As lovers or as husbands? The lover is totally annihilated, and courtship, the most agreeable scene in life, can no longer have place where women have not the free disposal of themselves, but are bought and sold like the meanest animal. The husband is as little a gainer, having found the admirable secret of extinguishing every part of love except its jealousy. No rose without its thorn, but he must be a foolish wretch indeed that throws away the rose and preserves only the thorn. But the Asiatic manners are as destructive to friendship as to love. Jealousy excludes men from all intimacies and familiarities with each other. No one dares bring his friend to his house or table lest he bring a lover to his numerous wives. Hence, all over the East, each family is as much separate from another as if they were so many distinct kingdoms. No wonder, then, that Solomon, living like an Eastern prince with his seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines, without one friend, could write so pathetically concerning the vanity of the world. Had he tried the secret of one wife or mistress, a few friends, and a great many companions, he might have found life somewhat more agreeable. Destroy love and friendship. What remains in the world worth accepting? Next we quote his famous statement of the principle of utility in morals. There has been a controversy started of late much better worth examination concerning the general foundation of morals, whether they be derived from reason or from sentiment.
whether we attain the knowledge of them by a chain of argument and induction, or by an immediate feeling and finer internal sense, whether, like all sound judgment of truth and falsehood, they should be the name to every rational intelligent being, or whether, like the perception of beauty and deformity, they be founded entirely on the particular fabric and constitution of the human species. The ancient philosophers, though they often affirm that virtue is nothing but conformity to reason, yet in general seem to consider morals as deriving their existence from taste and sentiment. On the other hand, our modern inquirers, though they also talk much of the beauty of virtue and deformity of vice, yet have commonly endeavored to account for these distinctions by metaphysical reasonings, and by deductions from the most abstract principles of the understanding. Such confusion reigned in these subjects that an opposition of the greatest consequence could prevail between one system and another, and even in the parts of almost each individual system, and yet nobody, till very lately, was ever sensible of it. The elegant Lord Shaftesbury, who first gave occasion to remark this distinction, and who in general adhered to the principles of the ancients, is not himself entirely free from the same confusion. In all determinations of morality the circumstance of public utility is ever principally in view, and wherever disputes arise, either in philosophy or common life, concerning the bounds of duty, the question cannot by any means be decided with greater certainty than by ascertaining on any side the true interests of mankind. If any false opinion, embraced from appearances, has been found to prevail as soon as farther experience and sounder reasoning have given us juster notions of human affairs, we retract our first sentiment, and adjust anew the boundaries of moral good and evil. Giving alms to common beggars is naturally praised, because it seems to carry relief to the distressed and indignant. But when we observe the encouragement thence arising to idleness and debauchery, we regard that species of charity rather as a weakness than a virtue. Tyrannicide, or the assassination of usurpers and oppressive princes, was highly extolled in ancient times, because it both freed mankind from many of these monsters, and seemed to keep the others in awe whom the sword or poniard could not reach. But history and experience having since convinced us that this practice increases the jealousy and cruelty of princes, a Timoleon and a Brutus, though treated with indulgence on account of the prejudices of their times, are now considered as very improper models for imitation. Liberality in princes is regarded as a mark of beneficence. But when it occurs that the homely bread of the honest and industrious is often thereby converted into delicious cakes for the idle and the prodigal, we soon retract our heedless praises. The regrets of a prince for having lost a day were noble and generous, but had he intended to have spent it in acts of generosity to his greedy courtiers, it was better lost than misemployed after that manner that justice is useful to society, and consequently that part of its merit at least must arise from that consideration, it would be superfluous undertaking to prove. That public utility is the sole origin of justice, that reflections on the beneficial consequences of this virtue are the sole foundation of its merit. This proposition being more curious and important will better deserve our examination and inquiry. Let us suppose that nature has bestowed on the human race such profuse abundance of all external conveniences, that without any uncertainty in the event, without any care or industry on our part, every individual finds himself fully provided with whatever his most voracious appetite can want, or luxurious imagination wish or desire. His natural beauty, we shall suppose, surpasses all acquired ornaments. The perpetual clemency of the seasons renders useless all clothes or covering. The raw herbage affords him the most delicious fare, the clear fountain the richest beverage. No laborious occupation required, no tillage, no navigation. Music, poetry, and contemplation form his sole business. Conversation, mirth, and friendship his sole amusement. 
It seems evident that in such a happy state every other social virtue would flourish and receive tenfold increase. But the cautious, jealous virtue of justice would never once have been dreamed of. For what purpose making a partition of goods, where everyone has already more than enough? Why give rise to property where there cannot possibly be an injury? Why call this object mine? When upon seizing of it by another, I need but stretch out my hand to possess myself of what is equally valuable. Justice in that case, being totally useless, would be an idle ceremonial, and could never possibly have place in the catalogue of virtues. We see, even in the present necessitous condition of mankind, that wherever any benefit is bestowed by nature in an unlimited abundance, we leave it always in common among the whole human race, and make no subdivisions of right and property. Water and air, though the most necessary of all objects, are not challenged as the property of individuals. Nor can any man commit injustice by the most lavish use and enjoyment of these blessings. In fertile, extensive countries with few inhabitants, land is regarded on the same footing, and no topic is so much insisted on by those who defend the liberty of the seas as the unexhausted use of them in navigation. Were the advantages procured by navigation as inexhaustible, these reasoners had never had any adversaries to refute, nor had any claims ever been advanced of a separate exclusive dominion over the ocean. Suppose a society to fall into such want of all common necessaries, that the utmost frugality and industry cannot preserve the greater number from perishing, and the whole from extreme misery. It will readily, I believe, be admitted that the strict laws of justice are suspended in such a pressing emergence, and given place to the stronger motives of necessity and self-preservation. Is it any crime after a shipwreck to seize whatever means or instrument of safety one can lay hold of without regard to former limitations of property? Or, if a city besieged were perishing with hunger, can we imagine that men will see any means of preservation before them and lose their lives from a scrupulous regard to what, in other situations, would be the rules of equity and justice? The use and tendency of that virtue is to procure happiness and security by preserving order in society. But where the society is ready to perish from extreme necessity, no greater evil can be dreaded from violence and injustice, and every man may now provide for himself by all the means which prudence can dictate or humanity permit. The public, even in less urgent necessities, opens granaries without the consent of proprietors, as justly supposing that the authority of magistracy may, consistent with equity, extend so far. But were any number of men to assemble without the tie of laws or civil jurisdiction, would an equal partition of bread and of famine, though affected by power and even violence, be regarded as criminal or injurious? Suppose, likewise, that it should be a virtuous man's fate to fall into the society of ruffians, remote from the protection of laws and government. What conduct must he embrace in that melancholy situation? He sees such a desperate rapaciousness prevail, such a disregard to equity, such contempt of order, such stupid blindness to future consequences, as must immediately have the most tragical conclusion, and must terminate in destruction to the greater number, and in total dissolution of society to the rest. He, meanwhile, can have no other expedient than to arm himself to whomever the sword he seizes or the buckler may belong to make provision of all means of defense and security, and his particular regard to justice being no longer of use to his own safety or that of others, he must consult the dictates of self-preservation alone, without concern for those who no longer merit his care and attention. But perhaps the difficulty of accounting for these effects of usefulness, or its contrary, has kept philosophers from admitting them into their systems of ethics, and has induced them to employ any other principle in explaining the origin of moral good and evil. 
But it is no just reason for rejecting any principle, confirmed by experience, that we cannot give a satisfactory account of its origin, nor are able to resolve it into other more general principles. And if we would employ a little thought on the present subject, we need be at no loss to account for the influence of utility, and deduce it from principles the most known and avowed in human nature. Usefulness is agreeable, and engages our approbation. This is a matter of fact, confirmed by daily observation. But useful for what? For somebody's interest, surely. Whose interest, then? Not our own only. For our approbation frequently extends farther. It must, therefore, be the interest of those who are served by the character or action approved of. And these, we may conclude, however remote, are not totally indifferent to us. By opening up this principle, we shall discover one great source of moral distinctions. The origin and mischiefs of theistic influences is the subject of the following passage. It must necessarily, indeed, be allowed that in order to carry men's attention beyond the present course of things, or lead them into any inference concerning invisible intelligent power, they must be actuated by some passion which prompts their thought and reflection, some motive which urges their first inquiry. But what passion shall we here have recourse to for explaining an effect of such mighty consequence? Not speculative curiosity, surely, or the pure love of truth. That motive is too refined for such gross apprehensions, and would lead men into inquiries concerning the frame of nature, a subject too large and comprehensive for their narrow capacities. No passions, therefore, can be supposed to work upon such barbarians. But the ordinary affections of human life, the anxious concern for happiness, the dread of future misery, the terror of death, the thirst of revenge, the appetite for food and other necessaries, agitated by hopes and fears of this nature, especially the latter, men scrutinize with a trembling curiosity the course of future causes, and examine the various and contrary events of human life and in this disordered scene, with eyes still more disordered and astonished, they see the first obscure traces of divinity. We hang in perpetual suspense between life and death, health and sickness, plenty and want, which are distributed amongst the human species by secret and unknown causes, whose operation is oft unexpected and always unaccountable. These unknown causes, then, become the constant object of hope and fear, and while the passions are kept in perpetual alarm by an anxious expectation of the events, the imagination is equally employed in forming ideas of those powers on which we have so entire a dependence. Could men anatomize nature according to the most probable, at least the most intelligible philosophy, they would find that these causes are nothing but the particular fabric and structure of the minute parts of their own bodies, and of external objects, and that by a regular and constant machinery all the events are produced, about which they are so much concerned. There is a universal tendency among mankind to conceive all beings like themselves, and to transfer to every object those qualities with which they are familiarly acquainted, and of which they are intimately conscious. We find human faces in the moon, armies in the clouds, and by a natural propensity, if not corrected by experience and reflection, ascribe malice or good will to everything that hurts or pleases us. Hence the frequency and beauty of the prosopopoeia in poetry, where trees, mountains, and streams are personified, and the intimate parts of nature acquire sentiment and passion. And though these poetical figures and expressions gain not on the belief, they may serve at least to prove a certain tendency in the imagination, without which they could neither be beautiful nor natural. Nor is a river-god or homodryad always taken for a mere poetical or imaginary personage, but may sometimes enter into the real creed of the ignorant vulgar.
while each grove or field is represented as possessed of a particular genius or invisible power which inhabits and protects it. Nay, philosophers cannot entirely exempt themselves flora this natural frailty, but have oft ascribed to inanimate matter the horror of a vacuum, sympathies, antipathies, and other affections of human nature. The absurdity is not less, while we cast our eyes upwards, and transferring, as is too usual, human passions and infirmities to the deity, represent him as jealous and revengeful, capricious and partial, and, in short, a wicked and foolish man in every respect but his superior power and authority. No wonder, then, that mankind, being placed in such an absolute ignorance of causes, and being at the same time so anxious concerning their future fortune, should immediately acknowledge a dependence on invisible powers, possessed of sentiment and intelligence. The unknown causes, which continually employ their thought, appearing always in the same aspect, are all apprehended to be of the same kind or species. Nor is it long before we ascribe to them thought and reason and passion, and sometimes even the limbs and fingers of men, in order to bring them nearer to a resemblance with ourselves. It is remarkable that the principles of religion have a kind of flux and reflux in the human mind, and that men have a natural tendency to rise from idolatry to theism, and to sink again from theism into idolatry. The vulgar that is, indeed, all mankind, a few excepted, being ignorant and uninstructed, never elevate their contemplation to the heavens or penetrate by their disquisitions into the secret structure of vegetable or animal bodies, so far as to discover a supreme mind or original providence, which bestowed order on every part of nature. They consider these admirable works in a more confined and selfish view, and finding their own happiness and misery, too, depend on the secret influence and unforeseen concurrence of external objects. They regard with perpetual attention the unknown causes which govern all these natural events, and distribute pleasure and pain, good and ill, by their powerful but silent operation. The unknown causes are still appealed to on every emergency, and in this general appearance or confused image are the perpetual objects of human hopes and fears, wishes and apprehensions. By degrees the active imagination of men, uneasy in this abstract conception of objects about which it is incessantly employed, begins to render them more particular, and to clothe them in shapes more suitable to its natural comprehension. It represents them to be sensible, intelligent beings like mankind, actuated by love and hatred and flexible by gifts and entreaties, by prayers and sacrifices. Hence the origin of religion, and hence the origin of idolatry or polytheism. More has been written by theologians in endeavors to refute the following passage than has ever been called forth by the wit of man before by the same number of words. A miracle is a violation of the laws of nature, and as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. Why is it more probable that all men must die, that lead cannot of itself remain suspended in the air, that fire consumes wood and is extinguished by water? unless it be that these events are found agreeable to the laws of nature, and there is required a violation of these laws, or, in other words, a miracle, to prevent them. Nothing is esteemed a miracle, if it ever happen in the common course of nature. It is no miracle that a man seemingly in good health should die on a sudden, because such a kind of death, though more unusual than any other, has yet been frequently observed to happen. But it is a miracle that a dead man should come to life, because that has never been observed in any age or country. There must, therefore, be a uniform experience against every miraculous event. Otherwise the event would not merit that appellation. 
and as a uniform experience amounts to a proof, there is here a direct and full proof from the nature of the fact against the existence of any miracle. Nor can such a proof be destroyed, or the miracle rendered credible, but by an opposite proof, which is superior. The plain consequence is, and it is a general maxim worthy of our attention, that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle, unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. And even in that case there is a mutual destruction of arguments, and the superior only gives us an assurance suitable to that degree of force which remains after destructing the inferior. When any one tells me that he saw a dead man restored to life, I immediately consider with myself whether it be more probable that this person should either deceive or be deceived, or that the fact which he relates should really have happened. I weigh the one miracle against the other, and according to the superiority which I discover, I pronounce my decision and always reject the greater miracle. If the falsehood of his testimony would be more miraculous than the event which he relates, then and not till then can he pretend to command my belief or opinion. There is not to be found in all history any miracle attested by a sufficient number of men of such unquestioned good sense, education, and learning as to secure us against all delusion in themselves, of such undoubted integrity as to place them beyond all suspicion of any design to deceive others, of such credit and reputation in the eyes of mankind as to have a great deal to lose in case of their being detected in any falsehood and at the same time attesting facts performed in such a public manner, and in so celebrated a part of the world as to render the detection unavoidable. All which circumstances are requisite to give us a full assurance of the testimony of men. One of the best attested miracles in all profane history is that which Tacitus reports of Vespasian, who cured a blind man in Alexandria by means of his spittle and a lame man by the mere touch of his foot, in obedience to a vision of the good Seraphis who had enjoined them to have recourse to the Emperor or for these miraculous cures. The story may be seen in that fine historian where every circumstance seems to add weight to the testimony, and might be displayed at large with all the force of argument and eloquence if any one were now concerned to enforce the evidence of that exploded and idolatrous superstition. The gravity, solidity, age, and probity of so great an emperor, who thought the whole course of his life conversed in a familiar manner with his friends and courtiers, and never affected those extraordinary airs of divinity assumed by Alexander and Demetrius, the historian, a contemporary writer noted for candor and veracity, and withal the greatest and most penetrating genius perhaps of all antiquity, and so free from any tendency to credulity that he even lies under the contrary imputation of atheism and profaneness. The persons from whose authority he related the miracle of established character for judgment and veracity, as we may well presume eye-witnesses of the fact and confirming their testimony after the Flavian family was despoiled of the empire, and could no longer give any reward as the price of a lie. Utrumqua qui interfuir, nuc quoqui memorant, postquam nullum mendacio pretium. To which, if we add the public nature of the facts as related, it will appear that no evidence can well be supposed stronger for so gross and so palpable a falsehood. These extracts will give some idea of the grace and power and penetration of Hume. The society he kept, the abilities with which he was justly credited, the reputation his works deservedly won for him, made him a man of mark and influence in his day. Read by the learned, courted by statesmen, he taught gentlemen liberality and government's toleration. The influence of Hume, silent and inappreciable to the multitude, has been of the utmost importance to the nation. His works have been studied by philosophers, politicians, and prelates. The writings of no freethinker except Voltaire have maintained their ground with continually increasing reputation. 
Oddly enough, none of Hume's works were popular when they first appeared. In fact, his treatise on human nature he had to reprint in the form of essays five years after its first publication. It then, for the first time, began to be bought, but not to any great extent. Five years later he again made it reappear under the form of an inquiry concerning the human understanding. It was not until this third publication that he began to perceive symptoms of its coming into notice. The world has since made up for its negligence by perpetual comment and solid appreciation. A king among thinkers, the clergy have in the provinces of politics and philosophical speculation to acknowledge allegiance to him, however they may rebel against his theological heresies. End of David Hume by John Watts The Doctrine of Fascism by Benito Mussolini From the Encyclopedia Italiana, Volume 14 The English translation is by Mr. I. S. Munro This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fundamental Ideas 1. Philosophic Conception like every concrete political conception, fascism is thought and action. It is action with an inherent doctrine which, arising out of a given system of historic forces, is inserted in it and works on it from within. It has, therefore, a form correlated to the contingencies of time and place. But it has, at the same time, an ideal content which elevates it into a formula of truth in the higher region of the history of thought. There is no way of exercising a spiritual influence on the things of the world by means of a human willpower commanding the wills of others, without first having a clear conception of the particular and transient reality on which the willpower must act, and without also having a clear conception of the universal and permanent reality in which the particular and transient reality has had its life and being. To know men, we must have a knowledge of man, and to have a knowledge of man, we must know the reality of things and their laws. There can be no conception of a state which is not fundamentally a conception of life. It is a philosophy or intuition, a system of ideas which evolves itself into a system of logical contraction, or which concentrates itself in a vision or in a faith, but which is always, at least virtually, an organic conception of the world. 2. Spiritualized Conception Fascism would therefore not be understood in many of its manifestations, as, for example, in its organizations of the party, its system of education, its discipline, were it not considered in the light of its general view of life, a spiritualized view. To fascism, the world is not this material world which appears on the surface, in which man is an individual separated from all other men, standing by himself, and subject to a natural law which instinctively impels him to lead a life of momentary and egotistic pleasure. In fascism, man is an individual who is the nation and the country. He is this by a moral law, which embraces and binds together individuals and generations in an established tradition and mission. A moral law, which suppresses the instinct to lead a life confined to a brief cycle of pleasure, in order instead, to replace it within the orbit of duty in a superior conception of life, free from the limits of time and space, a life in which the individual by self-abnegation and by the sacrifice of his particular interest, even by death, realizes the entire spiritual existence in which his value as a man consists. 3. Positive Conception of Life as a Struggle It is therefore a spiritual conception, itself also a result of the general reaction of the century against the languid and materialistic positivism of the 18th century. Anti-positivist, but positive, neither skeptical nor agnostic, neither pessimistic nor passively optimistic, as are in general the doctrines, all of them negative, which place the center of life outside of man, who by his free will can and should create his own world for himself. Fascism wants a man to be active and to be absorbed in action with all his energies. 
It wants him to have a manly consciousness of the difficulties that exist and to be ready to face them. It conceives life as a struggle, thinking that it is a duty of man to conquer that life which is really worthy of him, creating in the first place within himself the physical, moral, intellectual instrument with which to build it. As for the individual, so for the nation, so for mankind. Hence the high value of culture in all its forms, art, religion, science, and the supreme importance of education. Hence also the essential value of labor, with which man conquers nature and creates the human world, economic, political, moral, intellectual. 4. Ethical Conception this positive conception of life is evidently an ethical conception, and it compromises the whole reality as well as the human activity which domineers it. No action is to be removed from the moral sense. Nothing is to be in the world that is divested of the importance which belongs to it in respect of moral aims. Life, therefore, as the fascist conceives it, is serious, austere, religious, entirely balanced in a world sustained by the moral and responsible forces of the spirit. The fascist disdained the easy life. 5. Religious Conception Fascism is a religious conception in which man is considered to be in the powerful grip of superior law, with an objective will which transcends a particular individual and elevates him into a fully conscious member of a spiritual society. Anyone who has stopped short at the mere consideration of opportunism in the religious policy of the fascist regime has failed to understand that fascism, besides being a system of government, is also a system of thought. 6. Historical and Realist Conception Fascism is a historical conception in which man could not be what he is without being a factor in the spiritual process to which he contributes, either in the family sphere or in the social sphere, in the nation or in history in general to which all nations contribute. Hence is derived the great importance of tradition in the records, language, customs, and rules of human society. Man without a part in history is nothing. For this reason, fascism is opposed to all the abstractions of an individualistic character based upon materialism typical of the 18th century. And it is opposed to all the Jacobin innovations and utopias. It does not believe in the possibility of happiness on earth as conceived by the literature of the economist of the 17th century. It therefore spurns all the teleological conceptions of final causes through which, at a given period of history, a final systemization of the human race would take place. Such theories only mean placing oneself outside real history and life, which is a continual ebb and flow and process of realizations. Politically speaking, fascism aims at being a realistic doctrine. In its practice, it aspired to solve only the problems which present themselves of their own accord in the process of history, and which of themselves find or suggest their own solution. To have the effect of action among men, it is necessary to enter into the process of reality and to master the forces actually at work. 7. The Individual and Liberty Anti-individualistic, the fascist conception is for the state. It is for the individual only insofar as he coincides with the state, universal consciousness, and will of man in his historic existence. It is opposed to the classic liberalism which arose out of the need of reaction against absolutism, and had accomplished its mission in history when the state itself had become transformed into popular will and consciousness. Liberalism denied the state in the interest of the particular individual. Fascism reaffirms the state as the only true expression of the individual. And if liberty is to be the attribute of the real man, and not of the scarecrow invented by the individualistic liberalism, then fascism is for liberty. It is for the only kind of liberty that is serious, the liberty of the state and of the individual in the state. Because for the fascist, all is comprised in the state, and nothing spiritual or human exists, much less has any value, outside the state. In this respect, fascism is a totalizing concept, and the fascist state, the unification and synthesis of every value, interprets, develops, and potentates the whole life of the people. 8. Conception of a Corporate State No individuals or groups, political parties, associations, labor unions, classes, outside the state. For this reason, fascism is opposed to socialism, which clings rigidly to class war, and the historic evolution, 
and ignores the unity of the state, which molds the classes into a single moral and economic reality. In the same way, fascism is opposed to the unions of the laboring classes. But within the orbit of the state, with ordinative functions, the real needs, which give rise to the socialist movement and to the forming of labor unions, are emphatically recognized by fascism, and are given their full expression in the corporative system, which conciliates every interest in the unity of the state. 9. Democracy Individuals form classes according to categories of interest. They are associated according to differentiated economic activities which have a common interest. But first and foremost, they form the state. The state is not merely either the numbers or the sum of individuals forming the majority of a people. Fascism, for this reason, is opposed to the democracy which identifies people with the greatest number of individuals and reduces them to a majority level. But if people are conceived, as they should be, qualitatively and not quantitatively, then fascism is democracy in its purest form. The qualitative conception is the most coherent and truest form, and is therefore the most moral, because it sees a people realized in the consciousness and will of the few, or even of the one only, an ideal which moves to its realization in the consciousness and will of all. By all is meant all who derive their justification as a nation, ethnically speaking, from their nature and history, and who follow the same line of spiritual formation and development as one single will and consciousness. Not as a race, nor as a geographically determined region, but as a progeny that is rather the outcome of history which perpetuates itself, a multitude unified by an idea embodied in the will to have power and to exist, conscious of itself and of its personality. 10. Conception of the State This higher personality is truly the nation, in so much as it is the State. The nation does not beget the State, according to the decrepit nationalistic concept, which was used as a basis for the publicists of the national states in the 19th century. On the contrary, the nation is created by the State which gives the people, conscious of their own moral unity, the will, and thereby an effective existence. The right of a nation to its independence is derived not from a literary and ideal consciousness of its own existence, much less from a de facto situation, more or less inert and unconscious, but from an active consciousness, from an active political will, disposed to demonstrate its right. That is to say, a kind of state already in its pride, in fire. The state, in fact, as a universal ethical will, is the creator of right. 11. Dynamic Reality The nation, as a state, is an ethical reality which exists and lives in measure as it develops. A standstill is its death. Therefore, the state is not only the authority which governs and which gives the forms of law and the worth of the spiritual life to the individual wills, but it is also the power which gives effect to its will in foreign matters, causing it to be recognized and respected by demonstrating through facts the universality of all the manifestations necessary for its development. Hence it is organization as well as expansion, and it may be thereby considered, at least virtually, equal to the very nature of the human will, which in its evolution recognizes no barriers, and which realizes itself by proving its infinity. 12. The Role of the State The fascist state, the highest and most powerful form of personality, is a force, but a spiritual one. It reassumes all the forms of the moral and intellectual life of man. It cannot, therefore, be limited to a simple function of order and of safeguarding, as was contented by liberalism. It is not a simple mechanism which limits the sphere of the presumed individual liberties. It is an internal form and rule, a discipline of the entire person. It penetrates the will as well as the intelligence. Its principle, a central inspiration of the living human personality in the civil community, descends into the depths and settles in the heart of the man of action as well as the thinker, of the artist as well as of the scientist, the soul of our soul. 13. Discipline and Authority Fascism, in short, is not only a lawgiver and the founder of institutions, but an educator and promoter of the spiritual life. 
It aims to rebuild not the forms of human life, but its content, the man, the character, the faith. And for this end, it exacts discipline and an authority which descends into and dominates the interior of the spirit without opposition. Its emblem, therefore, is the Lictorian Fasces, symbol of unity, of force, and of justice. Politics and Social Doctrine 1. Origins of the Doctrine When, in the now distant March of 1919, I summoned a meeting at Milan, through the columns of the Popolo d'Italia, of those who had supported and endured the war, and who had followed me since the constitution of the Fasci, or Revolutionary Action, in January 1915, there was no specific doctrinal plan in my mind. I had the experience of one only doctrine, that of socialism from 1903 to 04, to the winter of 1914, about a decade. But I made it first in the ranks, and later as a leader, and it was never an experience in theory. My doctrine, even during that period, was a doctrine of action. A universally accepted doctrine of socialism had not existed since 1915, when the revolutionist movement started in Germany, under the leadership of Bernstein. Against this, in the swing of tendencies, a left revolutionary movement began to take shape. But in Italy, it never went further than in the field of phrases. Whereas in Russian socialistic circles, it became the prelude of Bolshevism, reformism, revolutionaryism, centrism. This is a terminology of which even the echoes are now spent. But in the great river of fascism are currents which flow from Sori, from Pagai, from Lagardelle, and the movement Socialisti, from Italian syndicates which were legion between 1904 and 1914, and sounded a new note in Italian socialist circles, weakened then by the betrayal of Giolitti, through Olivetti's Pagini Libere, Orano's La Lupa, and Enrico Leone's De Verne Social. After the war, in 1919, socialism was already dead as a doctrine. It existed only as a grudge. In Italy especially, it had one only possibility of action, reprisals against those who wanted the war and must now pay its penalty. The Popolo d'Italia carried a subtitle, Daily of Ex-Servicemen and Producers, and the word producers was already then an expression of a turn of mind. Fascism was not the nursing of a doctrine previously worked out at a desk. It was born of the need for action, and it was action. It was not a party. In fact, during the first two years, it was an anti-party and a movement. The name I gave the organization fixed its character. Yet whoever should read the now crumpled sheets with the minutes of the meeting at which the Italian Fasce di Combattimento were constituted would fail to discover a doctrine, but would find a series of ideas, of anticipations, of hints which, liberated from the inevitable strangleholds of contingencies, were destined after some years to develop into doctrinal conceptions. Through them, fascism became a political doctrine to itself, different by comparison to all others, whether contemporary or of the past. I said then, if the bourgeoisie think we are ready to act as lightning conductors, they are mistaken. We must go towards labor. We wish to train the working classes to directive functions. We wish to convince them that it is not easy to manage industry or trade. We shall fight the technique and the spirit of the rearguard. When the succession of the regime is open, we must not lack the fighting spirit. We must rush and if the present regime be overcome, it is we who must fill its place. The claim to succession belongs to us, because it was we who forced the country into war, and we who led her to victory. The present political representation cannot suffice. We must have a direct representation of all interest. Against this program, one might say it is a return to corporations, but that does not matter. Therefore, I should like this assembly to accept the claims put in by national syndicalism from an economic standpoint. Is it not strange that the word corporation should have been uttered at the first meeting of Piazza San Sepulcro, when one considers that, in the course of the revolution, it came to express one of the social and legislative creations at the very foundations of the regime? 2. Development the years which preceded the march on Rome were years in which the necessity of action did not permit complete doctrinal investigations or elaborations. The battle was raging in the towns and villages. There were discussions, but what was more important and sacred 
there was death. Men knew how to die. The doctrine, all complete and formed, with divisions into chapters, paragraphs, and accompanying elucubrations, might be missing. But there was something more decided to replace it. There was faith. Notwithstanding, whoever remembers with the aid of books and speeches, whoever could search through them and select, would find that the fundamental principles were laid down whilst the battle raged. It was really in those years that the fascist idea armed itself, became refined, and proceeded towards organization. The problems of the individual and of the state, the problems of authority and of liberty, the political and social problems, especially national, the fight against the liberal, democratic, socialist, and popular doctrines, was carried out together with the punitive expeditions. But, as a system was lacking, our adversaries in bad faith denied to fascism any capacity to produce a doctrine, though that doctrine was growing tumultuously, at first under the aspect of violent and dogmatic negation, as happens to all newly born ideas, and later under the positive aspect of construction, which was successfully realized in the years 1926, 28, and 29, through laws and institutions of the regime. Fascism today stands clearly defined, not only as a regime, but also as a doctrine. This word doctrine should be interpreted in the sense that fascism today, when passing criticism on itself and others, has its own point of view, and its own point of reference, and therefore also its own orientation when facing those problems which beset the world in the spirit and in the matter. 3. Against Passivism, War and Life as a Duty as far as the general future and development of humanity is concerned, and apart from any mere consideration of current politics, fascism above all does not believe either in the possibility or utility of universal peace. It therefore rejects the pacifism which masks surrender and cowardice. War alone brings all human energies to their highest tension and sets a seal of nobility on the peoples who have the virtue to face it. All other tests are but substitutes which never make a man face himself in the alternative of life or death. A doctrine which has its starting point at the prejudicial postulate of peace is therefore extraneous to fascism. In the same way, all international creations, which as history demonstrates can be blown to the winds when sentimental, ideal, and practical elements storm the heart of a people, are also extraneous to the spirit of fascism. Even if such international creations are accepted, for whatever utility they may have in any determined political situation. Fascism also transports this anti-passivist spirit into the life of individuals. The proud squadrista motto, me de fregro, I don't give a damn, scrawled on the bandages of the wounded is an act of philosophy, not only stoic. It is a summary of a doctrine not only political, it is an education in strife and an acceptance of the risks which it carried. It is a new style of Italian life. It is thus that the fascist loves and accepts life, ignores and disdains suicide, understands life as a duty, a lifting up, a conquest, something to be filled in and sustained on a high plane, a thing that has to be lived through for its own sake, but above all for the sake of others near and far, present and future. 4. The Demographic Policy and the Neighbor the demographic policy of the regime is the result of these premises. The fascist also loves his neighbor, but neighbor is not for him a vague and undefinable word. Love for his neighbor does not prevent necessary educational severities. Fascism rejects professions of universal affection, and though living in the community of civilized peoples, it watches them and looks at them differently. It follows them in their state of mind and in the transformation of their interest but it does not allow itself to be deceived by fallacious and mutable appearances. 5. Against Historical Materialism and Class Struggle Through this conception of life, fascism becomes the emphatic negation of that doctrine which constituted the basis of the so-called scientific socialism or Marxism. The doctrine of historical materialism, according to which the story of human civilization is to be explained only by the conflict of interest between the various social groups, and by the change of the means and instruments of production. That the economic vicissitudes, discovery of prime or raw materials, new methods of labor, scientific inventions, have their particular importance, is denied by none. But that they suffice to explain human history, 
excluding other factors from it, is absurd. Fascism still believes in sanctity and in heroism, that is to say, in acts in which no economic motive, immediate or remote, operates. Fascism, having denied historical materialism, by which men are only puppets in history, appearing and disappearing on the surface of the tides, while in the depths the real directive forces act and labor, it also denies the immutable and irreparable class warfare, which is the natural filiation of such an economistic conception of history. And it denies above all that class warfare is the prepondering agent of social transformation. Being defeated on these two capital points of its doctrine, nothing remains of socialism save the sentimental aspirations, as old as humanity, to achieve a community of social life in which the sufferings and hardships of the humblest classes are alleviated. But here fascism repudiates the concept of an economic happiness which is to be, at a given moment in the evolution of economy, socialistically and almost automatically realized by assuring to all the maximum of well-being. Fascism denies the possibilities of the materialistic concept of happiness. It leaves that to the economist of the first half of the 17th century. That is, it denies the equation, well-being, happiness, which reduces man to the state of the animals, mindful of only one thing, that of being fed and fattened, reduced, in fact, to a pure and simple vegetative existence. 6. Against Democratic Ideologies After disposing of socialism, fascism opens a breach on the whole complex of the democratic ideologies, and repudiates them in their theoretic premises as well as in their practical application or instrumentation. Fascism denies that numbers, by mere fact of being numbers, can direct human society. It denies that these numbers can govern by means of periodical consultations. It affirms also the fertilizing, beneficent, and unassailable inequality of men, who cannot be leveled through an extrinsic and mechanical process such as universal suffrage. Regimes can be called democratic which, from time to time, give the people the illusion of being sovereign, whereas the real and effective sovereignty exists in other, and often very secret and irresponsible forces. Democracy is a regime without a king, but very often with many kings, far more exclusive, tyrannical, and ruinous than a single king, even if he be a tyrant. This explains why fascism, which, for contingent reasons, had assumed a republican tendency before 1922, renounced it previous to the march on Rome, with the conviction that the political constitution of a state is not nowadays a supreme question, and that, if the examples of the past and present monarchies and past and present republics are studied, the result is that neither monarchies nor republics are to be judged under the assumption of eternity, but that they merely represent forms in which the extrinsic political evolution takes shape as well as the history, the tradition, and the psychology of a given country. Consequently, fascism glides over the antithesis between monarchy and republic, on which democraticism wasted time, blaming the former for all social shortcomings, and extolling the latter as a regime of perfection. We have now seen that there are republics which may be profoundly absolutist and reactionary, and monarchies which welcome the most venturesome social and political experiments. 7. Untruths of Democracy Reason and science, says Renan, who had certain pre-fascist enlightenments in one of his philosophical meditations, are products of mankind, but to seek reason directly for the people and through the people is a chimera. It is not necessary for the existence of reason that everybody should know it. In any case, if this initiation were to be brought about, it could not be through low-class democracy which seems to lead rather to the extinction of every other culture and of every great discipline. The principle that society exists only for the welfare and liberty of individuals composing it does not seem to conform with the plans of nature, plans in which the species only is taken into consideration and the individual appears sacrificed. It is strongly to be feared that the last word of democracy thus understood, I hasten to add that it can also be differently understood, would be a social state in which a degenerated mass would have no preoccupation other than that of enjoying the ignoble pleasures of the vulgar person. Thus, Renan. In democracy, fascism rejects the absurd conventional falsehood of political equity, the habit of collective responsibility, and the myth of indefinite progress and happiness. But if there be a different understanding of democracy, if, in other words, Democracy can also signify to not push the people back as far as the margins of the state, 
then fascism may well have been defined by the present writer as an organized, centralized, authoritarian democracy. 8. Against Liberal Doctrines As regards the liberal doctrines, the attitude of fascism is one of absolute opposition both in the political and in the economic field. There is no need to exaggerate the importance of liberalism in the last century simply for the sake of present-day polemics, and to transform one of the numerous doctrines unfolded in that last century into a religion of humanity for all times, present and future. Liberalism did not flourish for more than a period of 15 years. It was born in 1830 from the reaction to the Holy Alliance which attempted to set Europe back to the period which preceded 89 and had its years of splendor in 1848, when also Pius IX was a liberal. Its decadence began immediately afterwards. If 1848 was a year of light and poesy, 1849 was a year of weakness and tragedy. The Roman Republic was killed by another republic, the French Republic. In the same year, Marx issued his famous Manifesto of Communism. In 1851, Napoleon III made his anti-liberal coup d'etat and reigned over France until 1870. He was overthrown by a popular movement, following one of the greatest defeats registered in history. The victor was Bismarck, who always ignored the religion of liberty and its prophets. It is symptomatic that a people of high civilization like the Germans completely ignored the religion of liberty throughout the whole 19th century, with but one parenthesis, represented by that which was called the ridiculous parliament of Frankfurt, which lasted one season. Germany realized its national unity outside of liberalism, against liberalism, a doctrine which seemed alien to the German spirit, essentially monarchical, since liberalism is a historical and logical antechamber of anarchy. The three wars of 1864, 1866, and 1870, conducted by liberals like Moltke and Bismarck, mark the three stages of German unity. As for Italian unity, liberalism played a very inferior part in the makeup of Mazzini and Garibaldi, who were not liberals. Without the intervention of the anti-liberal Napoleon, we would not have had Lombardy, and without help of the anti-liberal Bismarck, at Sadoa and Sedan, it is very likely that we would not have got Venice in 1866, or that we would have entered Rome in 1870. During the period of 1870 to 1915, the preachers of the new creed of themselves denounced the twilight of their religion. It was beaten in the breach by decadence in literature. It was beaten in the open by decadence in practice. Activism, that is to say nationalism, futurism, fascism. The liberal century, after having accumulated an infinity of Gordian knots, sought to cut them in the hecatomb of the World War. Never did any religion impose such a terrible sacrifice. Have the gods of liberalism slaked their bloodthirst? Liberalism is now on the point of closing the doors of its departed temples, because nations feel that its agnosticism in the economic field, and its indifference in political and moral matters, causes, as it has already caused, the sure ruin of states. That is why all the political experiences of the contemporary world are anti-liberal, and it is supremely silly to seek to classify them as things outside of history, as if history were a hunting ground reserved to liberalism and its professors, as if liberalism were the last and incomparable word of civilization. 9. Fascism does not turn back. The fascist negation of socialism, of democracy, of liberalism, should not lead one to believe that fascism wishes to push the world back to where it was before 1879, the date accepted as the opening year of the demo-liberal century. One cannot turn back. The fascist doctrine has not chosen de maestri for its profit. Monarchical absolutism is a thing of the past, and so is the worship of the church power. Feudal privileges and divisions into impenetrable castes with no connection between them are also have-beens. The conception of fascist authority has nothing in common with the police. A party that totally rules a nation is a new chapter in history. References and comparisons are not possible. From the ruins of the socialist, liberal, and democratic doctrines, fascism picks those elements that still have a living value, keeps those that might be termed facts acquired by history, and rejects the rest, namely, the conception of a doctrine good for all times and all people. 
admitting that the 19th century was a century of socialism, liberalism, and democracy, is not said that the 20th century must also be the century of socialism, of liberalism, of democracy. Political doctrines pass on, but peoples remain. One may now think that this will be the century of authority, the century of the right wing, the century of fascism. If the 19th century was a century of the individual, liberalism signifies individualism, one may think that this will be the century of collectivism, the century of the state. It is perfectly logical that a new doctrine should utilize the vital elements of other doctrines. No doctrine was ever born entirely new and shining, never seen before. No doctrine can boast of absolute originality. Each doctrine is bound historically to doctrines which went before, to doctrines yet to come. Thus, the scientific socialism of Marx is bound to the utopian socialism of Fourier, of Owen, of saint Simon. Thus, the liberalism of 1800 is linked with the movement of 1700. Thus, democratic doctrines are bound to the encyclopedist. Each doctrine tends to direct human activity towards a definite object. But the activity of man reacts upon the doctrine, transforms it, and adapts it to new requirements, or overcomes it. Doctrine, therefore, should be an act of life and not an academy of words. In this lie the pragmatic veins of fascism, its will to power, its will to be, its position with regards to violence, and its value. 10. The Value and Mission of the State The capital point of the fascist doctrine is the conception of the state, its essence, the work to be accomplished, its final aims. In the conception of fascism, the state is an absolute before which individual and groups are relative. Individuals and groups are conceivable in so much as they are in the state. The liberal state does not direct the movements and the material and spiritual evolution of collectivity, but limits itself to recording the results. The fascist state has its conscious conviction, a will of its own, and for this reason is called an ethical state. In 1929, at the first quinquennial assembly of the regime, I said, In fascism, the state is not a night watchman, only occupied with the personal safety of the citizens, nor is it an organization with purely material aims, such as that of assuring a certain well-being and a comparatively easy social cohabitation. A board of directors would be quite sufficient to deal with this. It is not a purely political creation either, detached from the complex material realities of the life of individuals and of peoples. The state, as conceived and enacted by fascism, is a spiritual and moral fact, since it gives concrete form to the political, juridical, and economic organization of the country. Furthermore, this organization, as it rises and develops, is a manifestation of the spirit. The state is a safeguard of interior and exterior safety, but it is also the keeper and transmitter of the spirit of the people, as it was elaborated through the ages, in its language, customs, and beliefs. The state is not only the present, it is also the past, and above all, the future. The state, insomuch as it transcends the short limits of individual lives, represents the eminent conscience of the nation. The forms in which the state expresses itself are subject to changes, but the necessity for the state remains. It is the state which educates the citizens in civic virtues, gives them a consciousness of their mission, presses them towards unity. The state harmonizes their interests through justice, transmits to prosperity the attainments of thoughts, in science, in arts, in laws, in the solidarity of mankind. The state leads men from primitive tribal life to that highest expression of human power which is empire, links up through the centuries the names of those who died to preserve its integrity or to obey its laws, holds up the memory of the leaders who increased its territory and of the geniuses who cast the light of glory upon it, as an example for future generations to follow. When the conception of the state declines and disintegrating or centrifugal tendencies prevail, whether of individuals or groups, then the national society is about to set. 11. The Unity of the State and the Contradictions of Capitalism from 1929 onwards to the present day, the universal, political, and economical evolution has still further strengthened the doctrinal positions. The giant who rules is the state. The one who can resolve the dramatic contradictions of capital is the state. 
What is called the crisis cannot be resolved except by the state and in the state. Where are the ghosts of Julius Simon who, at the dawn of liberalism, proclaimed that the state must set to work to make itself useless and prepare its resignation? Of McCullough, who, in the second half of the past century, proclaimed that the state must abstain from ruling? What would the Englishman Bentham say today to the continual and inevitably invoked intervention of the state in the sphere of economics? while, according to his theories, industry should ask no more of the state than to be left in peace. Or the German Humboldt, according to whom an idle state was the best kind of state. It is true that the second wave of liberal economists were less extreme than the first, and Adam Smith himself opened the door, if only very cautiously, to let state intervention into the economic field. If liberalism signifies the individual, then fascism signifies the state. But the fascist state is unique of its kind and is an original creation. It is not reactionary, but revolutionary, insomuch as it anticipates the solution of certain universal problems such as those which are treated elsewhere. One, in the political sphere, by the subdivision of parties, in the preponderance of parliamentarism, and in the irresponsibilities of assemblies. Two, in the economic sphere, by the functions of trade unions which are becoming constantly more numerous and powerful, whether in the labor or industrial fields, in their conflicts and combinations. And three, in the moral sphere, by the necessity of order, discipline, obedience to those who are the moral dictators of the country. Fascism wants the state to be strong, organic, and at the same time supported on a wide popular basis. As part of its task, the fascist state has penetrated the economic field, through the corporative, social, and educational institutions which it has created. The presence of the state is felt in the remotest ramifications of the country, and in the state also, all the political, economic, and spiritual forces of the nation circulate, mustered in their respective organizations. A state which stands on the support of millions of individuals who recognize it, who believe in it, who are ready to serve it, is not the tyrannical state of a medieval lord. It has nothing in common with the absolutist states before or after 89. The individual in the fascist state is not annulled, but rather multiplied, just as in a regiment a soldier is not diminished, but multiplied by the number of his comrades. The fascist state organizes the nation, but leaves a sufficient margin afterward to the individual. It has limited the useless or harmful liberties and has preserved the essential ones. The one to judge in this respect is not the individual, but the state. 12. The Fascist State and Religion The fascist state is not indifferent to the presence or the fact of religion in general, nor to the presence of that particular established religion which is Italian Catholicism. The state has no theology, but it has morality. In the fascist state, religion is considered as one of the most profound manifestations of the spirit. It is, therefore, not only respected, but defended and protected. The fascist state does not create its own god, as Robespierre wanted to do in a certain movement in the frenzies of the convention, nor does it vainly endeavor to cancel the idea of god from the mind, as Bolshevism tries to do. Fascism respects the god of the ascetics, of the saints, and of the heroes. It also respects god as he is conceived and prayed to in the ingenious and primitive heart of the people. 13. Empire and Discipline The fascist state is a will expressing power and empire. The Roman tradition here becomes an idea of force. In the fascist doctrine, empire is not only a territorial or a military or a commercial expression. It is a moral and a spiritual one. An empire can be thought of, for instance, as a nation which directly or indirectly guides other nations without the need of conquering a single mile of territory. For fascism, the tendency to empire, that is to say the expansion of nations, is a manifestation of vitality. Its contrary, the stay-at-home attitude, is a sign of decadence. Peoples who rise, or suddenly flourish again, are imperialistic. Peoples who die, are peoples who abdicate. Fascism is a doctrine which most adequately represents the tendencies the state of mind of a people like the Italian people, which is rising again after many centuries of abandonment and of foreign servitude. But empire requires discipline, the coordination of forces, duty, 
and sacrifice. This explains many phases of the practical action of the regime. It explains the aims of many of the forces of the state and the necessary severity against those who would oppose themselves to the spontaneous and irresistible movement of the Italy of the 20th century by trying to appeal to the discredited ideologies of the 19th century, which had been repudiated wherever great experiments of political and social transformation have been daringly undertaken. Never more than at the present moment have nations felt such a thirst for an authority, for a direction, for order. If every century has its own peculiar doctrine, there are a thousand indications that fascism is that of the present century. That it is a doctrine of life is shown by the fact that it has created a faith. That the faith has taken possession of the mind is demonstrated by the fact that fascism has its fallen and its martyrs. Fascism has now attained in the world a universality over all doctrines. Being realized, it represents an epoch in the history of the human mind. End of The Doctrine of Fascism by Benito Mussolini Recording by James Christopher, jxchristopher at yahoo.com A Few Words About Copyright in Books by Augustine Birrell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Copyright, which is the exclusive liberty reserved to an author and his assigns of printing or otherwise multiplying copies of his book during certain fixed periods of time, is a right of modern origin. There is nothing about copyright in Justinian's compilations. It is a mistake to suppose that books did not circulate freely in the era of manuscripts. St. Augustine was one of the most popular authors that ever lived. His City of God ran over Europe after a fashion impossible today thousands of busy hands were employed year out and year in making copies for sale of this famous treatise yet augustine had never heard of copyright and never received a royalty on sales in his life the word copyright is of purely english origin and came into existence as follows the stationer's company was founded by royal charter in fifteen fifty six and from the beginning has kept register books wherein first by decrees of the star chamber afterwards by orders of the houses of parliament and finally by act of parliament the titles of all publications and reprints have had to be entered prior to publication none but booksellers as publishers were then content to be called were members of the stationers company and by the usage of the company no entries could be made in their register books except in the names of members and thereupon the book referred to in the entry became the copy of the member or members who had caused it to be registered by virtue of this registration the book became in the opinion of the stationers company the property in perpetuity of the member or members who had effected the registration this was the right of the stationer to his copy. Copyright at first is therefore not an author's, but a bookseller's copyright. The author had no part or lot in it, unless he chanced to be both an author and a bookseller, an unusual combination in early days. 
the author took his manuscript to a member of the stationer's company and made the best bargain he could for himself the stationer if terms were arrived at carried off the manuscript to his company and registered the title in the books and thereupon became in his opinion and in that of his company the owner at common law in perpetuity of his copy the stationers having complete control over their register books made what entries they chose and all kinds of books even homer and the classics became the property of its members the booksellers nearly all londoners respected each other's copies and jealously guarded access to their registers from time to time there were sales by auction of a bookseller's copies but the public that is the country booksellers for there were no other likely buyers were excluded from the sale room a great monopoly was thus created and maintained by the trade there was never any examination of title to a bookseller's copy every book of repute was supposed to have a bookseller for its owner bunyan's pilgrim's progress was mr ponder's copy milton's paradise lost mr tonson's copy the whole duty of man mr eyre's copy and so on the thing was a corrupt and illegal trade combination the expiration of the licensing act and the consequent cessation of the penalties it inflicted upon unlicensed printing exposed the proprietors of copies to an invasion of their rights real or supposed and in seventeen hundred and three and again in seventeen ought six and seventeen ought nine they applied to parliament for a bill to protect them against the ruin with which they alleged themselves to be threatened footnote what the booksellers wanted was not to be left to their common law remedy i e an action of trespass on the case but to be supplied with penalties for infringement and especially with the right to seize and burn unauthorized editions End of footnote in seventeen hundred and ten they got what they asked for in the shape of the famous statute of queen anne the first copyright law in the world a truly english measure ill considered and ill drawn which did the very last thing it was meant to do viz destroy the property it was intended to protect by this act in which the author first makes his appearance actually in front of the proprietor it was provided that in case of new books the author and his assigns should have the sole right of printing them for fourteen years and if at the end of that time the author was still alive a second term of fourteen years was conceded in the case of existing books there was to be but one term viz twenty-one years from august tenth seventeen hundred and ten registration at the stationer's company was still required but nothing was said as to who might make the entries or into whose names they were to be made then followed the desired penalties for infringement 
the booksellers thought the terms of years meant no more than that the penalties were to be limited by way of experiment to those periods many years flew by before the stationers company discovered the mischief wrought by the statute they had themselves promoted to cut a long matter short it was not until seventeen seventy four that the house of lords decided that whether there ever had been a perpetuity in literary property at common law or not it was destroyed by the act of queen anne and that from and after the passing of that law neither author assignee nor proprietor of copy had any exclusive right of multiplication save for and during the periods of time the statute created it was a splendid fight a thirty years war great lawyers were feed in it luminous and lengthy judgments were delivered mansfield was a bookseller's man thurlow ridiculed the pretensions of the trade it can be read about in boswell's johnson and in campbell's lives of the lord chancellors the authors stood supinely by not contributing a farthing towards the expenses it was a bookseller's battle and the booksellers were beaten as they deserved to be all this is past history in which the modern money-loving motoring author takes scant pleasure things are on a different footing now the act of eighteen forty two has extended the statutory periods of protection the perpetuity craze is over a right in perpetuity to reprint frank fustian's novel or tom tatter's poem would not add a penny to the present value of the copyright of either of those productions in business short views must prevail an author cannot expect to raise money on his hope of immortality milton's publisher good mr simons probably thought if he thought about it at all that he was buying paradise lost for ever when he registered it as his copy in the books of his company but into the calculations he made to discover how much he could afford to give the author posterity did not and could not enter how was simons to know that milton's fame was to outlive cleveland's or flatman's how many of the books published in 1905 would have any copyright cash value in A.D. 2000? I do not pause for a reply. The modern author need have no quarrel with the statutory periods fixed by the Act of 1842. Footnote. Author's life plus seven years, or forty-two years from date of publication, whichever term is the longer. The great objection to the second term is that an author's books go out of copyright at different dates, and the earlier editions go out first. End of footnote though common sense has long since suggested that a single term the author's life and thirty or forty years after should be substituted for the alternative periods named in the act what the modern author alone desiderates is a big immediate and protected market 
the united states of america have been a great disappointment to many an honest british author in the wicked old days when the states took british books without paying for them they used to take them in large numbers but now that they have turned honest and passed a law allowing the british author copyright on certain terms they have in great measure ceased to take for by the strangest of coincidences no sooner were british novels histories essays and the like protected in america than there sprang up in the states themselves novelists historians and essayists not only numerous enough to supply their own home markets but talented enough to cross the atlantic in large numbers and challenge us in our own such a reward for honesty was not contemplated international copyright and the convention of bern are things to be proud of and rejoice over as the first chapter in a code of public european law they may mark the beginning of a time of settled peace order and disarmament but they have not yet enriched a single author though hereafter possibly an occasional novelist or playwright may prosper greatly under their provisions the copyright question is now at last really a settled question save in a single aspect of it what if anything should be done in the case of those authors few in number whose literary lives prove longer than the period of statutory protection should any distinction in law be struck between a tennyson and a tupper between but why multiply examples there is no need to be unnecessarily offensive the law and practice of to-day give the meat that remains on the bones of the dead author after the expiration of the statutory period of protection to the trade any publisher who likes to bring out an edition can do so though by doing so he does not gain any exclusive rights a brother publisher may compete with him as a result the public is usually well served with cheap editions of those non-copyright authors whose works are worth reprinting the moment the copyright expires some lovers of justice however think that it is unnecessary all at once to endow the trade with these windfalls and that if an author's family or his or their assignees were prepared to publish cheap editions immediately after the expiration of the usual period of protection they ought to be allowed to do so for a further period of say forty years if they failed within a reasonable time either to do so themselves or to arrange for others to do so this extended period should lapse were this to be the law nobody could say that it was unfair but it is never likely to be the law it would take time for discussion and now there is no time left in which to discuss anything in parliament a much needed copyright bill has been in draft for years has been mentioned in queen's and king's speeches but it has never been read even a first time if it ever is read a first time its only chance of becoming law will be if it is taken in a lump as it stands 
without consideration or amendment to such a pass has legislation been reduced in this country this draft bill does not contain any provision for specially protecting the families of authors whose works long outlive their mortal lives it makes no invidious distinctions it leaves all the authors to hang together the quick and the dead perhaps this is the better way End of A Few Words About Copyright in Books by Augustine Birrell Read by Martin Giessen How to Make the Best of Life by Samuel Butler This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I have been asked to speak on the question how to make the best of life, but may as well confess at once that I know nothing about it. I cannot think that I have made the best of my own life nor is it likely that i shall make much better of what may or may not remain to me i do not even know how to make the best of the twenty minutes that your committee has placed at my disposal and as for life as a whole whoever yet made the best of such a colossal opportunity by conscious effort and deliberation in little things no doubt deliberate and conscious effort will help us but we are speaking of large issues and such kingdoms of heaven as the making the best of these come not by observation the question therefore on which i have undertaken to address you is as you must all know fatuous if it be faced seriously life is like playing a violin solo in public and learning the instrument as one goes on one cannot make the best of such impossibilities and the question is doubly fatuous until we are told which of our two lives the conscious or the unconscious is held by the asker to be the truer life which does the question contemplate the life we know or the life which others may know but which we know not death gives a life to some men and women compared with which their so-called existence here is as nothing which is the truer life of shakespeare handel that divine woman who wrote the odyssey and of jane austen the life which palpitated with sensible warm motion within their own bodies or that in virtue of which they are still palpitating in ours in whose consciousness does their truest life consist their own or ours can shakespeare be said to have begun his true life till a hundred years or so after he was dead and buried his physical life was but as an embryonic stage a coming up out of darkness a twilight and dawn before the sunrise of that life of the world to come which he was to enjoy hereafter we all live for a while after we are gone hence but we are for the most part still born 
or at any rate die in infancy as regards that life which every age and country has recognised as higher and truer than the one of which we are now sentient as the life of the race is larger longer and in all respects more to be considered than that of the individual so is the life we live in others larger and more important than the one we live in ourselves this appears nowhere perhaps more plainly than in the case of great teachers who often in the lives of their pupils produce an effect that reaches far beyond anything produced while their single lives were yet unsupplemented by those other lives into which they infused their own death to such people is the ending of a short life but it does not touch the life they are already living in those whom they have taught and happily as none can know when he shall die so none can make sure that he too shall not live long beyond the grave for the life after death is like money before it no one can be sure that it may not fall to him or her even at the eleventh hour money and immortality come in such odd unaccountable ways that no one is cut off from hope we may not have made either of them for ourselves but yet another may give them to us in virtue of his or her love which shall illumine us for ever and establish us in some heavenly mansion whereof we neither dreamed nor shall ever dream look at the doge loredano loredani the old man's smile upon whose face has been reproduced so faithfully in so many lands that it can never henceforth be forgotten would he have had one hundredth part of the life he now lives had he not been linked awhile with one of those heaven-sent men who know che cosa è amor look at rembrandt's old woman in our national gallery had she died before she was eighty-three years old she would not have been living now then when she was eighty-three immortality perched upon her as a bird on a withered bough i seem to hear some one say that this is a mockery a piece of special pleading a giving of stones to those that ask for bread life is not life unless we can feel it and a life limited to a knowledge of such fraction of our work as may happen to survive us is no true life in other people salve it as we may death is not life any more than black is white the objection is not so true as it sounds i do not deny that we had rather not die nor do i pretend that much even in the case of the most favoured few can survive them beyond the grave it is only because this is so that our own life is possible others have made room for us and we should make room for others in our turn without undue repining what i maintain is that a not inconsiderable number of people do actually attain to a life beyond the grave which we can all feel forcibly enough whether they can do so or not that this life tends with increasing civilization to become more and more potent and that it is better worth considering in spite of its being unfelt by ourselves 
than any which we have felt or can ever feel in our own persons take an extreme case a group of people are photographed by edison's new process say titian's trebelli and jenny lind with any two of the finest men singers the age has known let them be photographed incessantly for half an hour while they perform a scene in lohengrin let all be done stereoscopically let them be phonographed at the same time so that their minutest shades of intonation are preserved let the slides be coloured by a competent artist and then let the scene be called suddenly into sight and sound say a hundred years hence are those people dead or alive dead to themselves they are but while they live so powerfully and so livingly in us which is the greater paradox to say that they are alive or that they are dead to myself it seems that their life in others would be more truly life than their death to themselves is death granted that they do not present all the phenomena of life whoever does so even when he is held to be alive we are held to be alive because we present a sufficient number of living phenomena to let the others go without saying those who see us take the part for the whole here as in everything else and surely in the case supposed above the phenomena of life predominate so powerfully over those of death that the people themselves must be held to be more alive than dead our living personality is as the word implies only our mask and those who still own such a mask as i have supposed have a living personality granted again that the case just put is an extreme one still many a man and many a woman has so stamped him or herself on his work that though we would gladly have the aid of such accessories as we doubtless presently shall have to the livingness of our great dead we can see them very sufficiently through the masterpieces they have left us as for their own unconsciousness i do not deny it the life of the embryo was unconscious before birth and so is the life i am speaking only of the life revealed to us by natural religion after death but as the embryonic and infant life of which we were unconscious was the most potent factor in our after-life of consciousness so the effect which we may unconsciously produce in others after death and it may be even before it on those who have never seen us is in all sober seriousness our truer and more abiding life and the one which those who would make the best of their sojourn here will take most into their consideration unconsciousness is no bar to livingness our conscious actions are a drop in the sea as compared with our unconscious ones could we know all the life that is in us by way of circulation nutrition breathing waste and repair we should learn what an infinitesimally small part consciousness plays in our present existence yet our unconscious life is as truly life as our conscious life and though it is unconscious to itself 
it emerges into an indirect and vicarious consciousness in our other and conscious self which exists but in virtue of our unconscious self so we have also a vicarious consciousness in others the unconscious life of those that have gone before us has in great part moulded us into such men and women as we are and our own unconscious lives will in like manner have a vicarious consciousness in others though we be dead enough to it in ourselves if it is again urged that it matters not to us how much we may be alive in others if we are to know nothing about it i reply that the common instinct of all who are worth considering gives the lie to such cynicism i see here present some who have achieved and others who no doubt will achieve success in literature will one of them hesitate to admit that it is a lively pleasure to her to feel that on the other side of the world some one may be smiling happily over her work and that she is thus living in that person though she knows nothing about it here it seems to me that true faith comes in faith does not consist as the sunday school pupil said in the power of believing that which we know to be untrue it consists in holding fast that which the healthiest and most kindly instincts of the best and most sensible men and women are intuitively possessed of without caring to require much evidence further than the fact that such people are so convinced and for my own part i find the best men and women i know unanimous in feeling that life in others even though we know nothing about it is nevertheless a thing to be desired and gratefully accepted if we can get it either before death or after i observe also that a large number of men and women do actually attain to such life and in some cases continue so to live if not for ever yet to what is practically much the same thing our life then in this world is to natural religion as much as to revealed a period of probation the use we make of it is to settle how far we are to enter into another and whether that other is to be a heaven of just affection or a hell of righteous condemnation who then are the most likely so to run that they may obtain this veritable prize of our high calling setting aside such lucky numbers drawn as it were in the lottery of immortality which i have referred to casually above and setting aside also the chances and changes from which even immortality is not exempt who on the whole are most likely to live anew in the affectionate thoughts of those who never so much as saw them in the flesh and know not even their names there is a nisus a straining in the dull dumb economy of things in virtue of which some whether they will it and know it or no are more likely to live after death than others and who are these those who aimed at it as by some great thing that they would do to make them famous those who have lived most in themselves and for themselves or those who have been most ensouled consciously but perhaps better unconsciously 
directly but more often indirectly by the most living souls past and present that have flitted near them can we think of a man or woman who grips us firmly at the thought of whom we kindle when we are alone in our honest doors plumes with none to admire or shrug his shoulders can we think of one such the secret of whose power does not lie in the charm of his or her personality that is to say in the wideness of his or her sympathy with and therefore life in and communion with other people in the wreckage that comes ashore from the sea of time there is much tinsel stuff that we must preserve and study if we would know our own times and people granted that many a dead charlatan lives long and enters largely and necessarily into our own lives we use them and throw them away when we have done with them i do not speak of these i do not speak of the virgils and alexander popes and who can say how many more whose names i dare not mention for fear of offending they are as stuffed birds or beasts in a museum serviceable no doubt from a scientific standpoint but with no vivid or vivifying hold upon us they seem to be alive but are not i am speaking of those who do actually live in us and move us to higher achievements though they be long dead whose life thrusts out our own and overrides it i speak of those who draw us ever more towards them from youth to age and to think of whom is to feel at once that we are in the hands of those we love and whom we would most wish to resemble what is the secret of the hold that these people have upon us is it not that while conventionally speaking alive they most merged their lives in and were in fullest communion with those among whom they lived they found their lives in losing them we never love the memory of any one unless we feel that he or she was himself or herself a lover i have seen it urged again in querulous accents that the so-called immortality even of the most immortal is not for ever i see a passage to this effect in a book that is making a stir as i write footnote the foundations of belief by the right hon a j balfour longmans eighteen ninety five page forty eight end of footnote i will quote it the writer says so it seems to me is the immortality we so glibly predicate of departed artists if they survive at all it is but a shadowy life they live moving on through the gradations of slow decay to distant but inevitable death they can no longer as heretofore speak directly to the hearts of their fellow-men evoking their tears or laughter and all the pleasures be they sad or merry of which imagination holds the secret driven from the market-place they become first the companions of the student then the victims of the specialist he who would still hold familiar intercourse with them must train himself to penetrate the veil which in ever thickening folds conceals them from the ordinary gaze he must catch the tone of a vanished society 
he must move in a circle of alien associations he must think in a language not his own this is crying for the moon or rather pretending to cry for it for the writer is obviously insincere i see the saturday review says the passage i have just quoted reaches almost to poetry and indeed i find many blank verses in it some of them very aggressive no prose is free from an occasional blank verse and a good writer will not go hunting over his work to rout them out but nine or ten in little more than as many lines is indeed reaching too near to poetry for good prose this however is a trifle and might pass if the tone of the writer was not so obviously that of cheap pessimism i know not which is cheapest pessimism or optimism one forces lights the other darks both are equally untrue to good art and equally sure of their effect with the groundlings the one extenuates the other sets down in malice the first is the more amiable lie but both are lies and are known to be so by those who utter them talk about catching the tone of a vanished society to understand rembrandt or giovanni bellini it is nonsense the folds do not thicken in front of these men we understand them as well as those among whom they went about in the flesh and perhaps better homer and shakespeare speak to us probably far more effectually than they did to the men of their own time and most likely we have them at their best i cannot think that shakespeare talked better than we hear him now in hamlet or henry the fourth like enough he would have been found a very disappointing person in a drawing-room people stamp themselves on their work if they have not done so they are naught if they have we have them and for the most part they stamp themselves deeper on their work than on their talk no doubt shakespeare and handel will be one day clean forgotten as though they had never been born the world will in the end die mortality therefore itself is not immortal and when death dies the life of these men will die with it but not sooner it is enough that they should live within us and move us for many ages as they have and will such immortality therefore as some men and women are born to achieve or have thrust upon them is a practical if not a technical immortality and he who would have more let him have nothing <laughs> i see i have drifted into speaking rather of how to make the best of death than of life but who can speak of life without his thoughts turning instantly to that which is beyond it he or she who has made the best of the life after death has made the best of the life before it who cares one straw for any such chances and changes as will commonly befall him here if he is upheld by the full and certain hope of everlasting life in the affections of those that shall come after if the life after death is happy in the hearts of others it matters little how unhappy was the life before it and now i leave my subject 
not without misgiving that i shall have disappointed you but for the great attention which is being paid to the work from which i have quoted above i should not have thought it well to insist on points with which you are i doubt not as fully impressed as i am but that book weakens the sanctions of natural religion and minimizes the comfort which it affords us while it does more to undermine than to support the foundations of what is commonly called belief therefore i was glad to embrace this opportunity of protesting otherwise i should not have been so serious on a matter that transcends all seriousness lord beaconsfield cut it shorter with more effect when asked to give a rule of life for the son of a friend he said do not let him try and find out who wrote the letters of junius pressed for further counsel he added nor yet who was the man in the iron mask and he would say no more don't bore people and yet i am by no means sure that a good many people do not think themselves ill-used unless he who addresses them has thoroughly well bored them especially if they have paid any money for hearing him my great namesake said surely the pleasure is as great of being cheated as to cheat and great as the pleasure both of cheating and boring undoubtedly is i believe he was right so i remember a poem which came out some thirty years ago in punch about a young lady who went forth in quest to some burden make or burden bear but which she did not greatly care o oh, misery so again all the holy men and women who in the middle ages professed to have discovered how to make the best of life took care that being bored if not cheated should have a large place in their programme still there are limits and i close not without fear that i may have exceeded them End of How to Make the Best of Life by Samuel Butler Read by Martin Giessen The Ideal of a Universal Religion An Address on Vedanta Philosophy by Swami Vivekananda Delivered at Hardman Hall, New York Sunday, January twelfth, eighteen ninety six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tim Ferreira. The Ideal of a Universal Religion How It Must Embrace Different Types of Minds and Methods. Wheresoever our senses reach, or our minds can imagine, we find action and reaction of the two forces, one counteracting the other, causing the constant play of these two, the mixed phenomena that we see around us or feel in our mind. In the external world, it is expressing itself in physical matter, as attraction and repulsion, centripetal and centrifugal. In the internal world, it explains the various mixed feelings of our nature, the opposites, love and hatred, good and evil. We repel some things, we attract some things. We are attracted by someone, we are repelled by someone. Many times in our lives we find without any reason whatsoever, we, as it were, are attracted toward certain persons. At other times, similarly, mysteriously, we are repelled by others. This is patent to all, and the higher the field of action, the more potent, the more remarkable are the actions of these forces. Religion is the highest plane of human thought. In herein we find that the actions of these two forces have been most marked. 
The intensest love that humanity has ever known has come from religion, and the most diabolical hatred that humanity has known has come from religion. The noblest words of peace the world has ever heard have come from men on this plane, and the bitterest denunciation that the world has ever known has sprung from religious men. The higher the object, the finer the organization, the more remarkable are its actions. So we find that in religion these two forces are very remarkable in their actions. No other human interest has deluged the world so much in blood as religion. At the same time, nothing has built so many hospitals and asylums for the poor. No other human influence has taken such care, not only of humanity, but of the lowest animals, as religion. Nothing makes us so cruel as religion. Nothing makes us so tender as religion. This has been in the past and will be in the future. Yet from the midst of this din and turmoil and strife and struggling, the hatred and jealousy of religions and sects, from time to time arise potent voices, crying above all this noise, making themselves heard from pole to pole, as it were, for peace, for harmony. Will it ever come? Our subject for discussion is, is it possible that there ever should come harmony in this tremendous plane of struggle? The world is agitated in the latter part of the century by questions of harmony. In society various plans are being proposed, various attempts are made to carry them into practice, but we know how difficult that is. People find it almost impossible to mitigate the fury of the struggle of life, to tone down the tremendous nervous tension that is in man. Now, if it is so difficult to bring harmony and peace and love in this little bit of our life which deals with the physical plane of man, the external, gross, outward side, a thousand times more difficult is it to bring peace and harmony in that internal nature of man. I would ask you for the time being to come out of the network of words. We are hearing from childhood such words as love and peace and brotherhood and equality and universal brotherhood. But they have become words without meaning, which we repeat like parrots, and it is natural for us to do so. We cannot help it. Great, gigantic souls who felt in their hearts these great ideas first manufactured these words, and at that time many understood their meaning. Later, ignorant people take the words and play upon them, and religion becomes a play in their hands, mere frothy words, not to be carried into practice. It becomes my father's religion, our nation's religion, your country's religion, and so forth. It becomes only a phase of patriotism. To bring harmony in religion, therefore, must be most difficult. Yet we will try to study this phenomenon. We see that in every religion there are three parts, I mean in every great and recognized religion. First, there is the philosophy, the doctrines, the ideals of that religion, which embodies the goal, embodies as it were the whole scope of that religion, lays before its votaries and followers the principle of that religion, the way to reach the goal. Next, that philosophy is embodied in mythology. So the second part is mythology. This mythology comes in the form of lives of men, or of supernatural beings, and so forth. It is the same thing as philosophy made a little more concrete. The abstractions of philosophy become concretized in the lives of men and supernatural beings. The last portion is the ritual. This is still more concrete, forms and ceremonies, various physical attitudes, flowers and incense, and everything that appeals to the senses. In this consists the ritual. You will find that everywhere recognized religions have all these three. Some lay more stress on one side, some on the other. We will take the first part, philosophy. Is there any universal philosophy for the world? Not yet. Each religion brings out its own doctrines and insists upon them as being the only real ones. And not only does it do that, but it thinks that the man who does not believe them must go to some horrible place. Some of them will not stop there. They will draw the sword to compel others to believe as they do. This is not through wickedness, but through a particular disease of the human brain called fanaticism. They are very sincere, these fanatics, the most sincere of human beings, but they are not more responsible than any other lunatics in the world. This disease of fanaticism is one of the most dangerous of all diseases. All the wickedness of human nature is aroused by it. Anger is stirred up, nerves are strung high, and human beings become like tigers. Is there any similarity, is there any harmony, any universal mythology? Certainly not. Each religion has its own mythology, with only this difference, that each one says, My stories are not mythologies. For instance, take the question home. I simply mean to illustrate it. I do not mean any criticism of any religion. The Christian believes that God took the shape of a dove and came down, and they think this is history and not mythology. But the Hindu believes that God is manifested in the cow. Christians say that is mythology and not history. 
superstition. The Jews think that if an image be made in the form of a box or a chest with an angel on either side, then it is to be placed in the Holy of Holies, it is sacred to Jehovah. But if the image be made in the form of a beautiful man or woman, they say, this horrible idol, break it down. This is our unity in mythology. If a man stands up and says, my prophet did such and such a wonderful thing, others say that is superstition. But their prophet did a still more wonderful thing, they say that this is historical. Nobody in the world, as far as I have seen, is able to find out the fine distinction between history and mythology in the brains of these gentlemen. All these stories are mythological, mixed up with a little history. Next come the rituals. One sect has one particular form of ritual and thinks that is the holy form, and that the rituals of another sect are simply errant superstition. If one sect worships a peculiar sort of symbol, another sect says, oh, it's horrible. Take, for instance, the most general form of symbol. The phallus symbol is certainly a sexual symbol, but gradually that part of it was forgotten, and it stands as a symbol of the Creator. Those nations which have this as their symbol never think of it as the phallus. It is just a symbol, and there it ends. But a man from another race sees in it nothing but the phallus and begins to condemn it, yet at the same time may be doing something that to the phallic worshipper appears most horrible. I will take two points, the phallus symbol and the sacrament of the Christians. To the Christians, the phallus is horrible, and to the Hindus, the Christian sacrament is horrible. They say that the Christian sacrament, the killing of a man and eating his flesh and blood to get the good qualities of that man, is cannibalism. This is what some of the savage tribes do. If a man is brave, they kill him and eat his heart, because they think it will give them the qualities of bravery possessed by that man. Even such a devout Christian as Sir John Lubbock admits this, and says the origin of this symbol is in this savage idea. The Christians generally do not admit this idea of its origin, and what it may imply never comes to their minds. It stands for a holy thing, and that is all they want to know. So even in rituals there is no universal symbol which can lead to a general recognition. Where, then, is this universality? How is it possible, then, to have a universal form of religion? That already exists. We all hear about the universal brotherhood and how societies stand up and want to preach this. But to what does it amount? Universal brotherhood. We are all equal, therefore make a sect. As soon as you make a sect, you protest against equality, and thus it is no more. Mohammedans say universal brotherhood, but what comes in reality? Nobody who is not a Mohammedan will be admitted. He will have his throat cut. The Christians say universal brotherhood, but anyone who is not a Christian must go to that place and be eternally barbecued. So we are being carried on in this world after universal brotherhood and equality, universal equality of property and thought and everything. And I would simply ask you to look askance and be a little reticent and take a little care of yourselves when you hear such talk in this world. Behind it, many times, comes intensest selfishness. In the winter, sometimes a cloud comes. It roars and roars, but it does not rain. But in the rainy season, the clouds speak not, but deluge the world with water. So those who are really workers and really feel the universal brotherhood of man do not talk much, do not make little sects for universal brotherhood. But their acts, their whole body, their posture, their movements, their walk, eating, drinking, their whole life, show that brotherhood for mankind that love and sympathy for all. They do not speak, they do. This world is getting full of blustering talk. We want a little more work and less talk. So far, we see that it is hard to find any universal ideas in this, and yet we know they exist. We are all human beings, but are we all equal? Certainly not. Who says we are equal? Only the man who is a lunatic, he alone can say we are all equal. Are we all equal in our brains, in our powers, in our bodies? One man is stronger than another, one man has more brain power than another. If we are all equal, why is this inequality? Who made it? We. Because we have more or less powers, more brain, more physical strength, it must make a difference. Yet we know that the doctrine appeals to us. Take another case. We are all human beings here, but there are some men and some women. Here is a black man, there is a white man, but all are men, all humanity. Various faces, I see no two faces here the same, yet we are all human beings. Where is this humanity? I cannot find it. When I try to analyze it, I do not find where it is. Either I find a man or a woman, either dark or fair, and among all these faces, that abstract humanity which is the common thing, I do not find when I try to grasp, to sense, and actualize it, and think of it. 
It is beyond the senses, it is beyond thought, beyond the mind, yet I know and am certain it is there. If I am certain of anything here, it is this humanity which is a common quality among all. And yet I cannot find it. This humanity is what you call God. In him we live and move and have our being. In him and through him we have our being. It is through this I see you as a man or a woman, yet when I want to catch or formulate it, it is nowhere, because it is beyond the senses, and yet we know that in it and through it everything exists. So with this universal oneness and sympathy, this universal religion which runs through all these various religions as God, it must and does exist through eternity. I am the thread that runs through all these pearls, and each pearl is one of these sects. They are all the different pearls, but the Lord is the thread that runs through all of them. Only the majority of mankind are entirely unconscious of it, yet they are working in it and through it. Not a moment can they stand outside it, because all work is only possible through and in it, yet we cannot formulate it. It is God himself. Unity and variety is the plan of the universe. Just as we are all men, yet we are all separate. As humanity I am one with you, and as Mr. So-and-so I am different from you. As a man you are separate from the woman, as a human being you are one with the woman. As a man you are separate from the animal, but as a living being, the man, the woman, the animal, the plant, all are one, and as existence, you are one with the whole universe. That existence is God, the ultimate unity in this universe. In him we are all one. At the same time, in manifestation, these differences must always remain. In our work, in our energies that are being manifested outside, these differences must remain always. We find then that if the idea of a universal religion is meant one set of doctrines should be believed by all mankind, it is impossible. It can never be, any more than there will be a time when all faces will be the same. Again, if we expect that there will be one universal mythology, that is also impossible. It cannot be. Neither can there be one universal ritual. This cannot be. When that time will come, this world will be destroyed, because variety is the first principle of life. What makes us formed beings? Differentiation. Perfect balance will be destruction. Suppose the amount of heat in this room, whose tendency is perfect diffusion, gets that diffusion, that heat will cease to be. What makes motion in this universe? Lost balance, that is all. That sort of unity can only come when the universe will be destroyed, but in the world such a thing is impossible. Not only so, it is dangerous. We must not seek that all of us should think alike. There would be no thought to think. We would be all alike, like Egyptian mummies in a museum, looking at each other without thought to think. It is this difference of thought, this differentiation, losing of the balance of thought, which is the very soul of our progress, the soul of thought. This must always be. What then do I mean by the ideal of a universal religion? I do not mean a universal philosophy, or a universal mythology, or a universal ritual, but I mean that this world must go on wheel within wheel, this intricate mass of machinery, most intricate, most wonderful. What can we do? We can make it run smoothly, we can lessen the friction, we can grease the wheels, as it were. By what? By recognizing variation. Just as we have recognized unity, by our very nature, so we must also recognize variation. We must learn that truth may be expressed in a hundred thousand ways, and each one yet be true. We must learn that the same thing can be viewed from a hundred different standpoints, and yet be the same thing. Take, for instance, the sun. Suppose a man standing on the earth looks at the sun when it rises in the morning. He sees a big ball. Suppose he starts toward the sun and takes a camera with him, taking photographs at every stage of his journey. At every thousand miles he takes a fresh photograph until he reaches the sun. At each stage, each photograph was different from the other photographs. In fact, when he gets back, he brings with him so many thousands of photographs of so many different suns, as it were, and yet we know it was the same sun photographed by the man at every stage of his progress. Even so with the Lord. Greater or lesser, through high philosophy or low, through the highest or lowest doctrines, through the most refined mythology or the grossest, through the most refined ritualism or the grossest, every sect, every soul, every nation, every religion, consciously or unconsciously, is struggling upward, Godward, and each vision is that of him and of none else. Suppose we each one of us go with a particular pot in our hand to fetch water from a lake. Suppose one has a cup, another a jar, another a bigger jar, and so forth, and we all fill them. When we take them up, the water in each case is got into the form of the vessel. He who brought the cup has water in the form of a cup. He who brought the jar, his water is in the shape of a jar, and so forth. 
but in every case water and nothing but water is in the vessel so in the case of religion our minds are like these little pots and each one of us is seeing god god is like that water filling these different vessels and in each vessel the vision of god comes in the form of the vessel yet he is one he is god in every case this is the recognition that we can get so far it is all right theoretically but is there any way of practically working it out we find that this recognition that all these various views are true has been very very old hundreds of attempts have been made in india in alexandria in europe in china in japan in tibet latest in america in various countries attempts have been made to formulate a harmonious religious creed to make all come together in love instead of fighting and yet they have all failed because there was no practical plan they admitted that all these religions were right but they had no practical way of bringing them together and yet keeping that individuality that plan alone will be practical which does not destroy the individuality of any man in religion and at the same time shows him a point of union but so far all these plans have been tried while proposing to take in all these various views have in practice tried to bring them down to a few doctrines and so have produced merely a fresh sect fighting struggling and pushing i have also my little plan i do not know whether it will work or not and i want to present it to you for discussion what is my plan in the first place i would ask mankind to recognize this maxim do not destroy iconoclastic reformers do no good to the world break not anything down but build help if you can if you cannot fold your hands and stand by and see things go on do not injure if you cannot help therefore destroy not say not a word against any man's conviction as far as they are sincere secondly take man where he stands and from thence give him a lift if the theory be right that god is the center and each one of us individuals is moving along one of the lines of the radii it is then perfectly true that each one of us must come to the center and at the center where all these radii meet all differences will cease but until we have come there differences must be and yet all these radii converge to the same center one of us is by nature traveling in one of these lines and another and another and so we only want to push along the line we are in and we will come to the center because all roads lead to rome therefore destroy not each one of us is naturally developing according to our own nature each nature will come to the highest truth and men must teach themselves what can you and i do do you think you can teach even a child you cannot a child teaches himself your duty is to remove the obstacles a plant grows do you make the plant grow your duty is to put a hedge round and see that no animal eats up the plant and there it ends the plant must grow itself so in the spiritual growth of every man none can teach you none can make you spiritual you have to teach yourselves the growth must come from inside out what can an external teacher do he can remove the obstructions a little and there his duty ends therefore help if you can but do not destroy give up all such ideas that you can make men spiritual it is impossible there is no other teacher but your own soul admit this what comes in society we see so many various natures of mankind there are thousands and thousands of varieties of minds and inclinations a practical generalization will be impossible but for my purpose i have sufficiently characterized them into four first the active working man he wants work tremendous energy in his muscles and his nerves he likes to work build hospitals do charitable works make streets and do all sorts of work planning organizing an active man there is then the emotional man who loves the sublime and the beautiful to an excessive degree he wants to think of the beautiful the mild part of nature love and the god of love and all these things he likes he loves with his whole heart those great souls of ancient times the prophets of religions the incarnations of god on earth he does not care whether reason can prove that christ existed or buddha existed he does not care for the exact date when the sermon on the mount was preached or the exact moment of christ's birth what he cares for is his personality the figure before him he does not even care whether it can be proved that such and such men existed or not such is his ideal such a nature as i have pictured is the lover he is the emotional man then again there is the mystic man whose mind wants to analyze its own self understand the workings of the human mind the psychology what are the forces that are working inside how to manipulate and know and get control over them this is the mystical mind there is then the philosopher who wants to weigh everything and uses intellect even beyond the philosophy now a religion to satisfy the largest portion of mankind must be able to supply food for all these various minds and this is wanting the existing sects are all one-sided 
You go to one sect. Suppose they preach love and emotion. They begin to sing and weep, and they preach love and all sorts of good things in people. But as soon as you say, My friend, that is all right, but I want something stronger than that. Give me an ounce of reason, a little philosophy. I want to handle things more gradually. Get out, they say. And they not only say get out, but want to send you to the other place if they can. The result is, that sect can only help people of an emotional mind, and none else. Others, they not only do not help, but try to destroy, and the most wicked part of the whole thing is, that they will not only not help others, but do not believe that they are sincere, and the sooner they get out, the better. There is the failing of the whole thing. Suppose you were in a sect of philosophers, talking of the mystic wisdom of India and the East, and all these big psychological terms fifty syllables long. And suppose a man like me, a common everyday man, goes there and says, Can you tell me anything to make me spiritual? The first thing they do is smile and say, Oh, you are too far below us in reason to exist. What do you know of spirituality? They are high-up philosophers. They show you the door. Then there are the mystical sects who are talking all sorts of things about different planes of existence, different states of mind, and what the power of the mind can do. And if you are an ordinary man and say, Show me anything good that I can do. I am not given much to that sort of speculation. Can you give me anything that fits me? They will smile and say, Look at that fool. He is nobody. The only thing we advise you to do is to commit suicide. Your existence is for nothing. And this is going on in the world. I would like to get extreme exponents of all these different sects and shut them up in a room and photograph that beautiful, derisive smile of theirs. This is the existing human nature, the existing condition of things. What I want to propose is a religion that will be equally acceptable to all minds. It must be equally philosophic, equally emotional, equally mystic, and equally active. If your professors from the colleges come, your scientific men and physicists, they will want reason. Let them have it as much as they want. There will be a point where they all give up and say, go not beyond this. If they say, give up this thing, it is superstitious, these ideas of God and salvation, I say, Mr. Philosopher, this is a bigger superstition, this body. Give it up, don't go home to dinner or your philosophic chair. Give up the body, and if you cannot, cry quarter and sit down there. In religion there must be that side, and we must be able to show how to realize the philosophy which teaches that the world is one, that there is but one existence in the universe. Similarly, if the mystic comes, we must be ready to show him the science of mental analysis, practically demonstrate it before him. Here you are, come, learn, nothing is done in a corner. And if emotional people come, we will sit with them and weep and weep in the name of the Lord. We will drink the cup of love and become mad. If the worker comes, we will go and work with him, work with all the energy that he has. And this will be the ideal of the nearest approach to a universal religion. Would to God that all men were so harmoniously blended that in their minds all these various elements of philosophy, of mysticism, of emotion, and work were present. And yet that is the ideal, my ideal, of a man. Everyone who has only one or two of these I call one-sided, and that is why this world is almost full of these one-sided men, with only one road in which they can move, and anything else is dangerous and horrible to them. The attempt to help mankind to become wonderfully balanced in these four directions is my ideal of religion, and this religion is what we in India call yoga, union between God and man, union between the lower self and the higher self. To the worker it is union between men and the whole of humanity, to the mystic between his lower and higher self, to the lover union between him and the god of love, and to the philosopher it is union of all existence. This is what is meant by yoga. This is a Sanskrit term, and these four divisions in Sanskrit have different names. The man who seeks after this union is called yogi. The worker is called karma yogi. But he who seeks it through love is called bhakti yogi. He who seeks it through mysticism is called raja yogi and he who seeks it through philosophy is called yana-yogi. So this word yoga comprises them all. Now first of all I will take up raja-yoga. What is this raja-yoga controlling the mind? In this country you are associating all sorts of hobgoblins with the word yoga. I am afraid, therefore, I must start by telling you that it has nothing to do with such things. No one of these yogas gives up reason. No one of them asks you to deliver your reason hoodwinked into the hands of priests, or any type whatever. No one of them asks that you give your allegiance to any superhuman messenger. Each one of them tells you to cling to your reason, to hold fast to reason. We find in all beings three sorts of instruments of knowledge. The first is the instinct, which you find mostly in animals, and to some degree in man, the lowest instrument of knowledge. What is the second instrument of knowledge? Reasoning. You find that mostly in men. 
Now, in the first place, instinct is insufficient, as you see in the animals. The sphere of their action is very limited, and within that limit, instinct acts. When it comes in man, it is developed into reason. The sphere has become enlarged. Yet it is still very insufficient. It can get only a little way, and then it stops. There it tells us it cannot go any further, and if you want to push it any further, the result is helpless confusion. Reason itself becomes unreasonable. The whole of logic becomes an argument in a circle. Take, for instance, the very basis of our perception, matter and force. What is matter? That which is acted upon by force. And force? That which acts upon matter. You see the complication, what the logicians call seesaw, one idea depending on the other, and that also depending on this one. You find a tremendous wall before the reason, beyond which reasoning cannot go, yet it wants to get into the infinite beyond. This world of ours, this universe which our senses feel, or our mind thinks of, is but one bit of the infinite which has been projected into the plane of consciousness, and within that little limit which has been caught in the network of consciousness works our reason, and not beyond. Therefore there must be some other instrument to take us beyond, and that instrument is called inspiration. So instinct, reason, and inspiration are the three instruments of knowledge. Instinct belongs to the animals, reason to men, and inspiration to God-men. But in all human beings are the germs of these three instruments of knowledge. They have got to be evolved, but they must be there. This must be remembered, that one is the development of the other, and therefore does not contradict the other. It is reason that develops into inspiration, and therefore inspiration does not contradict reason, but fulfills. Things which reason cannot get are brought to light by inspiration, but do not contradict reason. The old man does not contradict the child, but fulfills the child. Therefore you must always remember this, that the great danger lies here. Many times instinct is presented before the world as inspiration, and then come all the spurious claims. A fool or semi-lunatic thinks the jargons going on in his brain are inspirations, and he wants men to follow him. The most contradictory, irrational nonsense has been preached in the world, simply the instinctive jargon of lunatic brains trying to pass for inspiration. The first test must be that it must not contradict reason. So you see this is the basis of all these yogas. We take the Raja Yoga, the psychological yoga, the psychological way to union. It is a vast subject, and I will only point out to you the central idea of this yoga. There is one method in all knowledge that we have. From the lowest to the highest, from the smallest worm to the highest yogi, they have to use the same method, and that method is called concentration. The chemist who is working in his laboratory has concentrated all the powers of his mind and brought them into one focus and thrown them on the elements, and they stand analyzed, and his knowledge comes. The astronomer has concentrated the thoughts of his mind and brought them into one focus, and he throws them through his telescope, and stars and systems roll forward and give up their mysteries to him. So in every case, the professor in his chair, the student with his book, every man who is working. You are hearing me, and if my words interest you, your mind will be concentrated, and suppose a clock strikes or something happens, you will not hear it on account of this, and the more you are able to concentrate your mind, the better you will understand me, and the more I concentrate my love and powers, the better I will be able to tell you what I want to convey, and the more this power of concentration is in the mind, the more knowledge it can get, because this is the one and only method of knowledge. Down to the lowest shoe black. If he has more concentration, he will black shoes better. The cook will cook a meal better. In making money or in worshipping God or doing anything, the stronger the power of concentration, the better will that work be. This is the one call, the one knock which opens the gates of nature and lets out the floods of light. This is the only key, the one power, concentration. This system of Raja Yoga deals almost exclusively with this. In the present state of our body we are so much distracted, the mind is frittering away its energies upon a hundred sorts of things. As soon as I try to calm my thoughts and concentrate my mind upon one object of knowledge, thousands of thoughts rush into the brain, thousands of thoughts rush into the mind and disturb it. How to check that, bring it under control, this is the whole subject of study in Raja Yoga. We take the next, Karma Yoga, that of work. It is evident in society how there are so many persons who like some sort of activity, whose mind cannot be concentrated upon the plane of thought alone, and who have but one idea, concretized in work, visible and tangible. Yet there must be a science of that too. Each one of us is working, but the majority of us fritter away the greater portion of our energies because we do not know the secret of work. Where to work and how to work is the secret, how to employ the most part of our energies, how to bring them all to bear on the work that is before us. And along with that comes the other great objection with all work. Work must cause pain, and all misery and pain come from attachment. I want to do work, I want to do good to a human being, 
and it is ninety to one that that human being that I have helped will be ungrateful and go against me, and the result is pain. That will deter mankind from working, and spoils a good portion of their work and of the energy of mankind, this fear and this misery. Karma Yoga teaches how to work for work's sake, unattached, without caring who is helped and what for. The Karma Yogi works through his own nature, because it is good to work, and he has no object beyond that. His station in this world is that of a giver, and he never receives. He knows that he is giving, and does not ask anything back, and therefore he eludes the grasp of misery. The feeling of pain which comes is the reaction from attachment. There is then Bhakti Yoga, for the emotional nature, the lover. He wants to love God, he wants all sorts of rituals, flowers and incense, beautiful buildings, forms, and all these things. Do you mean to say they are wrong? One fact I will tell you. It is better for you to remember, in this country especially, that spiritual giants have been only produced by those sects which have got a very rich mythology and ritual. All those sects, who wanted to worship God without any form or ceremony, crushed without mercy everything that was beautiful and sublime. Their religion becomes a fanaticism at best, a dry thing. The history of the world is a standing witness to this fact. Therefore, do not decry these rituals and these mythologies. Let people have them. Let those who desire go through them. Neither have that little derisive smile. They are fools, let them have it. Not so. The greatest men I have seen in my life, the most wonderfully developed, have all come from these rituals. I do not hold myself worthy to stand at their feet. For me to criticize them? How do I know how these ideas act upon the human mind, what to accept and what to reject? We go on criticizing everything in the world. Therefore, let them have it. Let people have all the mythology they want, all the beautiful inspirations they want, for you must always know that these emotional natures do not care for your definition of the truth. God to them is something tangible, the only thing that is real. They feel, hear, and see it, and love it. They do not stop to analyze it. Your rationalist seems to be like that fool who, when he saw a beautiful statue, wanted to break it to pieces to see the material it was made of. Let them have God. Bhakti Yoga teaches them how to love, how to love without any ulterior motives, loving good for good's sake and not for going to heaven, for instance, to get a child or wealth or anything else. It teaches them that love itself is the highest recompense of love, the old doctrine that God himself is love. It teaches him to give all sorts of tribute to God as the Creator, the Omnipresent, the Omnipotent, Almighty Ruler, the Father or Mother, the highest word that can be said of him, the highest idea that the human mind can construe about him is that he is the God of love. Wherever there is love, it is he. Wherever there is any love, it is he, the Lord, present there. Where the husband kisses the wife, he is there in the kiss. Where mother kisses the child, he is there. Friends clasp their hands. He, the Lord, is there present, standing as the God of love. When a great man wants to help mankind, he is there giving it his love to mankind. Wherever the heart expands, he is there manifested. This is what Bhakti Yoga teaches. We lastly come to the Yana Yogi, the philosopher, the thinker, he who wants to go beyond. He is the man who is not satisfied with the little things of this world. His idea is to go beyond the routine work of eating, drinking, and so on. Not even the teachings of thousands of books will satisfy him. Not even these sciences will satisfy him. They only bring this little world, at best, before him. What else? Not even whole systems, the Milky Way, the whole universe will satisfy him. That is only a drop in the ocean of existence. His soul wants to go beyond all that into the very heart of being, by seeing reality as it is, by realizing it, being it, by becoming one with the universal being. That is the philosopher to whom God is not only the father or mother, not only the creator of this universe, its protector, its guide. These are but little words for him. For him, God is the life of his life, and the soul of his soul. God is his own self. Nothing remains to him and the mortal parts have been pounded by the ways of philosophy, and brushed away. What remains is God himself. Upon the same tree there are two birds, one on top, the other below. The one on the top is calm and silent, majestic, immersed in its own glory. The one below, on the lower branches, eating sweet and bitter fruits by turns, hopping from branch to branch and becoming happy and miserable by turns. After a time the lower bird ate an exceptionally bitter fruit and got disgusted and looked up, and there is the other bird, that wondrous one of golden plumage. He eats not, neither sweet nor bitter. Neither is he happy or miserable, but calm, the self-centered one, nothing beyond his self. But the lower bird forgot it, and again began to eat the sweet and bitter fruits of that tree. In a little while, another exceptionally bitter fruit comes. He feels miserable, looks up, and goes forward, and wants to get nearer to the upper bird. Again he forgets, and again looks up, and so he goes on. 
After a while, an exceptionally bitter fruit comes. Again he looks up, and comes nearer, and nearer, and nearer. The reflections of light from the plumage of that bird play around his own body, and he changes and seems to melt away. Still nearer he comes, everything melts away, and at last he finds the change. The lower bird was only the shadow, the reflection. He himself was the upper bird all the time. This eating of fruits, sweet and bitter, this lower little bird, weeping and happy by turns, was a vain chimera, a dream. The real bird was there, calm and silent, glorious and majestic, beyond grief, beyond sorrow. The upper bird is God, the Lord of this universe, and the lower bird is the human soul, eating the sweet and bitter fruits of this world, and then comes a blow. For a time he stops and goes toward the unknown for a moment, and a flood of light comes. He thinks this world is vain. He goes a little further, yet again the senses drag him down, and he begins to eat the sweet and bitter fruits of the world. Again, an exceptionally hard blow comes. He becomes open again. Thus he approaches and approaches, and as he gets nearer and nearer, he finds his old self melting away, and that he is God. When he has come near enough, he finds, He whom I have preached to you as the life of this universe, who is present in the atom, who is present in the big suns and moons, he is the basis of our own life, the background of our soul. Nay, thou art that. That is what this Yana Yoga teaches. It tells man he is the essentially divine. It shows to mankind the real unity of being, that each one of us is the Lord God himself manifested on earth. Each one of us, from the lowest worm that crawls under our feet to the highest beings at whom we look with awe, all these are manifestations of the same Lord. Then again, all these various yogas have to be carried out into practice. Theories will not do. First we have to hear, then we have to think, reason it out, impress it in our mind, and lastly we have to meditate upon it, realize it, until it becomes our whole life. No more it remains as ideas or as theories, it comes into our self. Religion is realization, not talk, nor doctrine, nor theories, however beautiful they may be. It is being and becoming, not hearing or acknowledging. It is not an intellectual assent, but the whole nature being changed into it. That is religion. By intellectual assent we can come to a hundred sorts of foolish things and change next day. But this being and becoming is what is religion. End of the Ideal of a Universal Religion by Swami Vivekananda An interview with Mark Twain by Rudyard Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. An interview with Mark Twain by Rudyard Kipling from C to C Letters of Travel. Read by John Greenman. You are a contemptible lot over yonder. Some of you are commissioners, and some lieutenant governors, and some have the V.C., and few are privileged to walk about the mall arm in arm with a viceroy. But I have seen Mark Twain this golden morning, have shaken his hand, and smoked a cigar, no, two cigars, with him, and talked with him for more than two hours. Understand clearly, I do not despise you. Indeed, I don't. I am only very sorry for you, from the Viceroy downward. To soothe your envy, and to prove that I still regard you as my equals, I will tell you all about it. They said in Buffalo that he was in Hartford, Connecticut, and again they said, Perchance he has gone upon a journey to Portland and a big fat drummer vowed that he knew the great man intimately and that mark was spending the summer in europe which information so upset me that i embarked upon the wrong train and was incontinently turned out by the conductor three-quarters of a mile from the station amid the wilderness of railway tracks have you ever encumbered with greatcoat and valise tried to dodge diversely minded locomotives when the sun was shining in your eyes but I forgot you have not seen Mark Twain, you people of no account. Saved from the jaws of the cowcatcher, me wandering devious a stranger met. Elmira is the place, Elmira in the state of New York, this state not two hundred miles away. And he added, perfectly unnecessarily, Slide, Kelly, slide. I slid on the west shore line, I slid till midnight and they dumped me down at the door of a frowsy hotel in Elmira. Yes, they knew all about that man Clemens. 
but reckoned he was not in town had gone east somewhere i had better possess my soul in patience till the morrow and then dig up the man clemens brother-in-law who was interested in coal the idea of chasing half a dozen relatives in addition to mark twain up and down a city of thirty thousand inhabitants kept me awake morning revealed elmira whose streets were desolated by railway tracks and whose suburbs were given up to the manufacture of door sashes and window frames it was surrounded by pleasant fat little hills rimmed with timber and topped with cultivation the chemung river flowed generally up and down the town and had just finished flooding a few of the main streets the hotel man and the telephone man assured me that the much-desired brother-in-law was out of town and no one seemed to know where the man clemens abode later on i discovered that he had not summered in that place for more than nineteen seasons and so was comparatively a new arrival a friendly policeman volunteered the news that he had seen twain or some one very like him driving a buggy the day before this gave me a delightful sense of nearness fancy living in a town where you could see the author of tom sawyer or some one very like him jolting over the pavements in a buggy he lives out yonder at east hill said the policeman three miles from here then the chase began in a hired hack up an awful hill where sunflowers blossomed by the roadside and crops waved and hopper's magazine cows stood in eligible and commanding attitudes knee-deep in clover all ready to be transferred to photogravure the great man must have been persecuted by outsiders aforetime and fled up the hill for refuge presently the driver stopped at a miserable little white wood shanty and demanded mr clemens i know he's a big bug and all that he explained but you can never tell what sort of notions those sort of men take into their heads to live in anyways there rose up a young lady who was sketching thistletops and goldenrod amid a plentiful supply of both and set the pilgrimage on the right path it's a pretty gothic house on the left-hand side a little way further on gothic <laughs> said the driver very few of the city hacks take this drive especially if they know they are coming out here and he glared at me savagely it was a very pretty house anything but gothic clothed with ivy standing in a very big compound and fronted by a veranda full of chairs and hammocks the roof of the veranda was a trellis work of creepers and the sun peeping through moved on the shining boards below decidedly this remote place was an ideal one for work if a man could work among these soft airs and the murmur of the long-eared crops appeared suddenly a lady used to dealing with rampageous outsiders mr clemens has just walked down town he is at his brother-in-law's house then he was within shouting distance after all and the chase had not been in vain with speed i fled and the driver skidding the wheel and swearing audibly arrived at the bottom of that hill without accidents it was in the pause that followed between ringing the brother-in-law's bell and getting an answer that it occurred to me for the first time mark twain might possibly have other engagements than the entertainment of escaped lunatics from india be they never so full of admiration and in another man's house anyhow what had i come to do or say suppose the drawing-room should be full of people suppose a baby were sick how was i to explain that i only wanted to shake hands with him then things happened somewhat in this order a big darkened drawing-room a huge chair a man with eyes a mane of grizzled hair a brown moustache covering a mouth as delicate as a woman's a strong square hand shaking mine and the slowest calmest levelest voice in all the world saying well you think you owe me something and you've come to tell me so that's what i call squaring a debt handsomely Puff, from a cob pipe i always said that a missouri meerschaum was the best smoking in the world and behold mark twain had curled himself up in the big armchair and i was smoking reverently as befits one in the presence of his superior 
the thing that struck me first was that he was an elderly man yet after a minute's thought i perceived that it was otherwise and in five minutes the eyes looking at me i saw that the gray hair was an accident of the most trivial he was quite young i was shaking his hand i was smoking his cigar and i was hearing him talk this man i had learned to love and admire fourteen thousand miles away reading his books i had striven to get an idea of his personality and all my preconceived notions were wrong and beneath the reality blessed is the man who finds no disillusion when he is brought face to face with a revered writer that was a moment to be remembered the landing of a twelve-pound salmon was nothing to it i had hooked mark twain and he was treating me as though under certain circumstances i might be an equal about this time i became aware that he was discussing the copyright question here so far as i remember is what he said attend to the words of the oracle through this unworthy medium transmitted you will never be able to imagine the long slow surge of the drawl and the deadly gravity of the countenance the quaint pucker of the body one foot thrown over the arm of the chair the yellow pipe clinched in one corner of the mouth and the right hand casually caressing the square chin copyright some men have morals and some men have other things i presume a publisher is a man he is not born he is created by circumstances some publishers have morals mine have they pay me for the english productions of my books when you hear men talking of bret hart's works and other works and my books being pirated ask them to be sure of their facts i think they'll find the books are paid for it was ever thus i remember an unprincipled and formidable publisher perhaps he's dead now he used to take my short stories i can't call it steal or pirate them it was beyond these things altogether he took my stories one at a time and made a book of it if i wrote an essay on dentistry or theology or any little thing of that kind just an essay that long he indicated half an inch on his finger any sort of essay that publisher would amend and improve my essay he would get another man to write some more to it or cut it about exactly as his needs required then he would publish a book called dentistry by mark twain that little essay and some other things not mine added theology would make another book and so on i do not consider that fair it's an insult but he's dead now i think i didn't kill him there is a great deal of nonsense talked about international copyright the proper way to treat a copyright is to make it exactly like real estate in every way it will settle itself under these conditions if congress were to bring in a law that a man's life was not to extend over a hundred and sixty years somebody would laugh that law wouldn't concern anybody the man would be out of the jurisdiction of the court a term of years in copyright comes to exactly the same thing no law can make a book live or cause it to die before the appointed time Tottletown, california was a new town with a population of three thousand banks fire brigade brick buildings and all the modern improvements it lived it flourished and it disappeared today no man can put his foot on any remnant of Tottletown, california it's dead london continues to exist bill smith author of a book read for the next year or so is real estate in Tottletown. william shakespeare whose works are extensively read is real estate in london let bill smith equally with mr shakespeare now deceased have as complete a control over his copyright as he would over his real estate let him gamble it away drink it away or 
give it to the church let his heirs and assigns treat it in the same manner every now and again i go up to washington sitting on a board to drive that sort of view into congress congress takes its arguments against international copyright delivered ready-made and congress isn't very strong i put the real estate view of the case before one of the senators he said suppose a man has written a book that will live forever i said neither you nor i will ever live to see that man but will assume it what then he said i want to protect the world against that man's heirs and assigns working under your theory i said you think that all the world has no commercial sense the book that will live forever can't be artificially kept up at inflated prices there will always be very expensive editions of it and cheap ones issuing side by side take the case of sir walter scott's novels mark twain continued turning to me when the copyright notes protected them i bought editions as expensive as i could afford because i liked them at the same time the same firm were selling editions that a cat might buy they had their real estate and not being fools recognized that one portion of the plot could be worked as a gold mine another as a vegetable garden and another as a marble quarry do you see what i saw with the greatest clearness was mark twain being forced to fight for the simple proposition that a man has as much right to the work of his brains think of the heresy of it as to the labor of his hands when the old lion roars the young whelps growl i growled assentingly and the talk ran on from books in general to his own in particular growing bold and feeling that i had a few hundred thousand folk at my back i demanded whether tom sawyer married judge thatcher's daughter and whether we were ever going to hear of tom sawyer as a man well i haven't decided quoth mark twain getting up filling his pipe and walking up and down the room in his slippers i have a notion of writing the sequel to tom sawyer in two ways in one i would make him rise to great honor and go to congress and in the other i should hang him then the friends and enemies of the book could take their choice here i lost my reverence completely and protested against any theory of the sort because to me at least tom sawyer was real oh he is real said mark twain he's all the boys that i have ever known or recollect but that would be a good way of ending the book then turning round because when you come to think of it neither religion training nor education avails anything against the force of circumstances that drive a man suppose we took the next four and twenty years of tom sawyer's life and gave a little joggle to the circumstances that controlled him he would logically and according to the joggle turn out a rip or an angel do you believe that then well, i think so isn't it what you call kismet yes but don't give him two joggles and show the result because he isn't your property any more he belongs to us he laughed a large wholesome laugh and this began a dissertation on the rights of a man to do what he liked with his own creations which being a matter of purely professional interest i will mercifully omit returning to the big chair he speaking of truth and the like in literature said that an autobiography was the one work in which a man against his own will and in spite of his utmost striving to the contrary revealed himself in his true light to the world a good deal of your life on the mississippi is autobiographical isn't it i asked as near as it can be when a man is writing to a book and about himself but in genuine autobiography i believe it is impossible for a man to tell the truth about himself or to avoid impressing the reader with the truth about himself i made an experiment once i got a friend of mine a man painfully given to speak the truth on all occasions a man who wouldn't dream of telling a lie and i made him write his autobiography for his own amusement and mine he did it the manuscript would have made an octavo novel but 
good honest man that he was in every single detail of his life that i knew about he turned out on paper a formidable liar he could not help himself it is not in human nature to write the truth about itself none the less the reader gets a general impression from an autobiography whether the man is a fraud or a good man the reader can't give his reasons any more than a man can explain why a woman struck him as being lovely when he doesn't remember her hair eyes teeth or figure and the impression that the reader gets is a correct one do you ever intend to write an autobiography well if i do it will be as other men have done with the most earnest desire to make myself out to be the better man in every little business that has been to my discredit and i shall fail like the others to make my readers believe anything except the truth this naturally led to a discussion on conscience then said mark twain and his words are mighty and to be remembered your conscience is a nuisance a conscience is like a child if you pet it and play with it and let it have everything that it wants it becomes spoiled and intrudes on all your amusements and most of your griefs treat your conscience as you would treat anything else when it is rebellious spank it be severe with it argue with it prevent it from coming to play with you at all hours and you will secure a good conscience that is to say a properly trained one a spoiled one simply destroys all the pleasure in life i think i have reduced mine to order at least i haven't heard from it for some time perhaps i have killed it from over severity it's wrong to kill a child but in spite of all i have said a conscience differs from a child in many ways perhaps it's best when it's dead here he told me a little such things as a man may tell a stranger of his early life and upbringing and in what manner he had been influenced for good by the examples of his parents he spoke always through his eyes a light under the heavy eyebrows anon crossing the room with a step as light as a girl's to show me some book or other then resuming his walk up and down the room puffing at the cob pipe i would have given much for nerve enough to demand the gift of that pipe value five cents when new i understand why certain savage tribes ardently desired the liver of brave men slain in combat that pipe would have given me perhaps a hint of his keen insight into the souls of men but he never laid it aside within stealing reach once indeed he put his hand on my shoulder it was an investiture of the star of india blue silk trumpets and diamond-studded jewel all complete if hereafter in the changes and chances of this mortal life i fall to cureless ruin i will tell the superintendent of the workhouse that mark twain once put his hand on my shoulder and he shall give me a room to myself and a double allowance of pauper's tobacco i never read novels myself said he except when the popular persecution forces me to when people plague me to know what i think of the last book that every one is reading and uh, how did the latest persecution affect you robert said he interrogatively i nodded i read it of course uh, for the workmanship that made me think i had neglected novels too long that there might be a good many books as graceful in style somewhere on the shelves so i began a course of novel reading i have dropped it now it did not amuse me but as regards robert the effect on me was exactly as though a singer of street ballads were to hear excellent music from a church organ i didn't stop to ask whether the music was legitimate or necessary i listened and i liked what i heard i am speaking of the grace and beauty of the style you see he went on every man has his private opinion about a book but that is my private opinion if i had lived in the beginning of things i should have looked around the township to see what popular opinion thought of the murder of abel before i openly condemned cain i should have had my private opinion of course but i shouldn't have expressed it until i had felt the way 
you have my private opinion about that book i don't know what my public ones are exactly they won't upset the earth he recurled himself into the chair and talked of other things i spend nine months of the year at hartford i have long ago satisfied myself that there is no hope of doing much work during those nine months people come in and call they call at all hours about everything in the world one day i thought i would keep a list of interruptions it began this way a man came and would see no one but mr clemens he was an agent for photogravure reproductions of salon pictures i very seldom use salon pictures in my books after that man another man who refused to see any one but mr clemens came to make me write to washington about something i saw him i saw a third man then a fourth by this time it was noon i had grown tired of keeping the list i wished to rest but the fifth man was the only one of the crowd with a card of his own he sent up his card ben Kuntz, hannibal missouri i was raised in hannibal ben was an old schoolmate of mine consequently i threw the house wide open and rushed with both hands out at a big fat heavy man who was not the ben i had ever known nor anything like him but is it you ben i said you've altered in the last thousand years the fat man said well i'm not coons exactly but i met him down in missouri and he told me to be sure and call on you and he gave me his card and here he acted the little scene for my benefit if you can wait a minute till i get out the circulars i'm not coons exactly but i'm traveling with the fullest line of rods you ever saw and what happened i asked breathlessly i shut the door he was not ben coons exactly not my old schoolfellow but i had shaken him by both hands in love and i had been bearded by a lightning rod man in my own house as i was saying i do very little work in hartford i come here for three months every year and i work four or five hours a day in a study down the garden of that little house on the hill of course i do not object to two or three interruptions when a man is in full swing of his work these little things do not affect him eight or ten or twenty interruptions retired composition i was burning to ask him all manner of impertinent questions as to which of his works he himself preferred and so forth but standing in awe of his eyes i dared not he spoke on and i listened grovelling it was a question of mental equipment that was on the carpet and i am still wondering whether he meant what he said personally i never care for fiction or story-books what i like to read about are facts and statistics of any kind if they are only facts about the raising of radishes they interest me just now for instance before you came in he pointed to an encyclopedia on the shelves i was reading an article about mathematics perfectly pure mathematics my own knowledge of mathematics stops at twelve times twelve but i enjoyed that article immensely i didn't understand a word of it but facts or what a man believes to be facts are always delightful that mathematical fellow believed in his facts so do i get your facts first and the voice dies away to an almost inaudible drone then you can distort em as much as you please bearing this precious advice in my bosom i left the great man assuring me with gentle kindness that i had not interrupted him in the least once outside the door i yearned to go back and ask some questions it was easy enough to think of them now but his time was his own though his books belonged to me i should have ample time to look back to that meeting across the graves of the days but it was sad to think of the things he had not spoken about in san francisco the men of the call told me many legends of mark's apprenticeship in their paper five and twenty years ago how he was a reporter delightfully incapable of reporting according to the needs of the day he preferred so they said to coil himself into a heap and meditate until the last minute then he would produce copy bearing no sort of relationship to his legitimate work copy that made the editor swear horribly and the readers of the call 
ask for more i should have liked to have heard mark's version of that with some stories of his joyous and variegated past he has been journeyman printer in those days he wandered from the banks of the missouri even to philadelphia pilot cub and full-blown pilot soldier of the south that was for three weeks only private secretary to a lieutenant governor of nevada that displeased him minor editor special correspondent in the sandwich islands and the lord only knows what else if so experienced a man could by any means be made drunk it would be a glorious thing to fill him up with composite liquors and in the language of his own country let him retrospect but these eyes will never see that orgy fit for the gods the pioneer allahabad 1890 reprinted in from sea to sea letters of travel 1913 end of an interview with mark twain by rudyard kipling read by john greenman A Motor Trip in San Diego's Back Country by J. A. Graves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. A Motor Trip in San Diego's Back Country by J. A. Graves. Come, you men and women automobilists. Get off the paved streets of Los Angeles and betake yourselves to the back country of San Diego County, where you can enjoy automobile life to the utmost during the summer. There, drink in the pure air of the mountains, perfumed with the breath of pines and cedars, the wild lilacs, the sweet pea vines, and a thousand aromatic shrubs and plants that render every hillside ever green from base to summit. Lay aside the follies of social conditions, and get back to nature, pure and unadorned, except with nature's charms and graces. To get in touch with these conditions, take your machines as best you can over any of the miserable roads, or rather apologies for roads, until you get out into the highway recently constructed from Bassett to Pomona. Run into Pomona to Gary Avenue, turn to the right, and follow it to the Chino Ranch. Follow the winding roads, circling to the Chino Hills, to Rencon, then on, over fairly good roads, to Corona. Pass through that city, then down the beautiful Temescal Canyon to Elsinore. Move on through Murrieta to Temecula. Three Routes Beyond Temecula, three routes are open to you. By one of them you keep to the left, over winding roads full of interest and beauty, through a great oak grove at the eastern base of Mount Palomar. Still proceeding through a forest of scattering oaks, you presently reach Warner's Ranch through a gate. Be sure and close all gates open by you. Only vandals leave gates open when they should be closed. Warner's Ranch is a vast meadow, mostly level, but sloping from northeast to southwest, with rolling hills and sunken valleys around its eastern edge. A chain of mountains, steep and timber-laden, almost encircles the ranch. For a boundary mark, on the northeastern side of the ranch are steep, rocky, and forbidding-looking mountains. Beyond them, the desert. The ranch comprises some 57,000 acres, nearly all valley land. It is well watered, filled with lakes, springs, meadows, and running streams, all draining to its lowest point, and forming the headwaters of the San Luis Rey River. You follow the road by which you enter the ranch to the left, and in a few miles' travel you bring up at Warner's Hot Springs, a resort famed for many years for the curative properties of its waters. The springs are now in charge of Mr. and Mrs. Stanford, and are kept in an admirable manner, considering all of the difficulties they labor under. The run from Los Angeles to the Springs is about a hundred and forty miles, and can be made easily in a day. Once there, the choice of many interesting trips is open to you. Past Temecula After leaving Temecula, another road, much frequented by the autoists, is the right-hand road by the Red Mountain grade to Fallbrook, 
either to del mar by way of oceanside or into the escondido valley by way of bonsal vista and san marcos the third route the center one between those i have described leads to pala with a party of five and a six-cylinder franklin car i went over the latter route on april twentieth nineteen eleven every inch of the road was full of interest we passed through pala with its ancient mission of that name and its horde of indian inhabitants the children of the indian school were having a recess and they carried on just about in the same manner that so many pale-faced children would leaving pala we followed the main road along the left bank of the san luis rey river where the san diego highway commission is now doing work which will when finished bring one to warner's ranch by an easy grade until we had gotten a few miles into the palma rancho we crossed the palma creek and some distance beyond it we left the river to our right turned sharply to the left and ran up to the base of smith's or palomar mountain then came the grade up the mountain if you are not stout-hearted and haven't a powerful machine avoid this beautiful drive if you are not driving an air-cooled car carry extra water with you you will need it before you reach the top the road is a narrow zigzag making an ascent of four thousand feet and a distance of from ten to twelve miles of switchbacking around the face of a steep rock-ribbed mountain to add to its difficulties the turns are so short that a long car is compelled to back up to negotiate them about an hour and a quarter is required to make the trip up the mountain we did all of it on low gear when the top is finally reached the view of the surrounding country is simply beyond description belated spring the mountain oaks of great size and broad of bough were not yet fully in leaf pines and cedars and to my astonishment many large sycamores were mingled with the oaks a gladsome crop of luscious grasses covered the earth shrubs and plants were bursting into bloom as we moved on we saw several wild pigeons in graceful flight among the trees after traveling the backbone of the mountain for some distance we came to a dimly marked trail leading to the left the major domo of our party said that this road led to doan's valley and that we must go down it it was a straight up and down road with exceedingly abrupt pitches in places damp and slippery and covered with fallen leaves at the bottom of the descent which it would have been impossible to retrace we came to a small stream directly in the only place where we could have crossed it a log stuck up which rendered passage impossible after a deal of prodding and hauling we dislodged it and safely made the ford Don's valley is one of those beauty spots which abound in the mountains of california its floor is a beautiful meadow in which are innumerable springs surrounding this meadow is heavy timber oaks pines and giant cedars palma creek flows out of this meadow through a narrow gorge which nature evidently intended should some day be closed with a dam to make of the valley a reservoir to conserve the winter waters we followed a partially destroyed road through the meadow to its upper end then as high and dry land was within sight we attempted to cross a small damp but uncertain looking waterway wheels stuck the front wheels passed safely but when the rear wheels struck it they went into the mud until springs and axles rested on the ground two full hours we labored before we left that mud hole we gathered up timbers and old bridge material then jacked up one wheel a little way and got something under it to hold it there the other side was treated the same way by repeating the operation many times we got the wheels high enough to run some timbers crosswise beneath them we put other timbers in front and pulled out we soon reached bailey's hotel a summer resort of considerable popularity we continued up the grade until we came on to the main road left by us when we descended into doan's valley we got up many more pigeons graceful birds which the legislature of our state should protect 
before they are exterminated. We moved on through heavily timber-covered hills, up and down grade, and finally came out on the south side of the mountain, overlooking the canyon, some five thousand feet deep, at the bottom of which ran the San Luis Rey River. What would have been a most beautiful scene was marred by a fog which had drifted up the canyon. But the cloud effect was marvelous. We were above the clouds. A more perfect sky no human being ever saw. The clouds, or fog banks, were so heavy that it looked as if we could have walked off into them. I never saw similar cloud effects anywhere else except from Mount Low, near Los Angeles, and Mount Tamalpais, in Marin County. Warner's Ranch We now began our descent to Warner's Ranch. It was gradual enough for some distance, and the road and trees were as charming as any human being could desire. Finally we came out onto a point overlooking the ranch. The view was simply entrancing. Imagine a vast amphitheater of fifty-seven thousand acres, surrounded by hills, dotted here and there with lakes, with streams of water like threads of burnished silver glittering in the evening light, softened by the clouds hanging over the San Luis Rey River. There were no clouds on the ranch. They stopped abruptly at the southwest corner. This vast meadow was an emerald green, studded with brilliant-colored flowers. Vast herds of cattle were peacefully completing their evening meal. The road down to the ranch follows a ridge, which is so steep that no machine has ever been able to ascend it. I held my breath, and trusted to the good old car that has done so much for my comfort, safety, and amusement. We were all glad when the bottom was reached. We forded the river, and whirled away to Warner's Hot Springs, over good meadow roads, arriving there before seven o'clock p.m. Some day these springs are going to be appreciated. Now only hardy travelers, as a rule, go there. Their medicinal qualities will in time be realized, and the people of Southern California will find that they have a Carlsbad within a short distance of Los Angeles, in San Diego County. We slept the sleep of the tired, weary tourist that night. Hot Baths The following day we passed in bathing in the hot mineral waters, sightseeing, and driving around the valley. Saturday morning, at 7.30 o'clock, we bade adieu to Mr. and Mrs. Stanford, and left the ranch by way of the Rancho Santa Isabel. The rain god must have been particularly partial to this beautiful ranch this season. Nowhere on our trip did we see such a splendid growth of grass and flowers, such happy-looking livestock, such an air of plenty and prosperity, as we did here. Leaving the ranch at the Santa Isabel store, we took the Julian Road, which place we reached after a few hours riding over winding roads good to travel on, and through scenery, which was a constant source of enjoyment. Julian is one of the early settlements of San Diego County. Mining has been carried on there with varying successes and disappointments these many years. Now, apple raising is its great industry. The hillsides are given over to apple culture. The trees are now laden with blossoms. As we topped a hill, or crossed a divide before beginning an ascent or descent, the view backward of the apple orchards, peeping up over slight elevations in the clearings, was extremely beautiful. Leaving Julian, we whirled along over splendid roads through a rolling country, given over to fruit farming, stock raising, and pasturage. We next reached Cuyamaca, and visited the dam of that name, which impounds the winter rains for the San Diego Flume Company. The country around the lake showed a deficiency of rainfall. The lake was far from full. We took our lunch at the clubhouse near the dam. After resting in the shade of the friendly oaks, we then pursued our journey to Descanso. We passed through Alpine and finally entered the El Cajon Valley famed far and wide for its muscatel grapes which seem especially adapted to its dark red soil the vines were in early leaf and not as pleasing to the eye as they will be when in full bloom then came bostonia a comparatively new settlement rosamond 
la mesa and finally we were whirled off on a splendid road through an unsettled country overgrown with sage and shrubs to del mar the sky was overcast all the afternoon a stiff ocean breeze blew inland cool and refreshing the entire day had been spent amid scenes of rare beauty the wild flowers are not yet out in profusion but enough were there to give the traveller an idea of what can be expected in floral offerings later in the season it was early spring wherever the elevation was thirty five hundred feet or better the oaks were not yet in leaf the sycamores just out in their new spring dresses the wild pea blossoms just beginning to open and cast their fragrance to the breezes far below yellow buttercups adorned the warmer spots in each sunny valley way below us in the open country great fields of poppies greeted the gladdened eye the freshness of spring was in the air each breath we inhaled was full of new life the odor of the pines mingled its fragrance with that of the apple blossoms del mar is the del monte of southern california we arrived at stratford inn at that place which is as well furnished and as well kept as any hotel on the coast a small garden an adjunct of the hotel shows what the soil and climate of del mar is capable of producing tomato vines are never frosted the vegetables from the garden have a fresher crisper taste than those grown in a drier atmosphere how good and comfortable the bed felt to us that night sleep came leaving the body inert and lifeless in one position for hours at a time the open air the sunshine the long ride the ever-changing scenery brought one joyous slumber such as a healthy happy tired child enjoys the next morning after an ample well-cooked and well-served breakfast we took the road on the last leg of our journey over miles and miles of new-made roads we sped soon the long detour up the san luis rey valley will be a thing of the past the new county highway will pursue a much more direct course we pass through miles of land being prepared for bean culture miles of hay and grain miles of pasturage in which sleek cattle grazed peacefully or having fed their fill lay upon the rich grasses and enjoyed life near the coast the growth of grain and grass far surpasses that of the interior santa margarita rancho with its boundless expanse of grass-covered pasturage lands its thousands of head of cattle and horses its thousands of acres of bean lands ready for seed is worth going miles to see at noon we reached san juan capistrano we drove into the grounds of the hospitable judge egan at a table beneath the grateful shade of giant trees amid the perfume of flowers the sweet songs of happy birds we ate our lunch after a short rest we took up the run again we passed el toro and finally came on to the great san joaquin ranch every acre of which is now highly cultivated then came the santa ana region thickly settled rich in soil and products we passed through beautiful and enterprising Santa Ana, through miles of pun miles of walnut, orange, and other fruit groves, through a solid settlement extending far on each side of the road to Anaheim, and still on through more walnut and orange groves, more wealth-producing crops. Through the orange and lemon and walnut groves of Fullerton, extending to and forming a large part of Whittier, I could not help exclaiming to myself, What an empire this is! Where is the country that yields the annual returns per acre that this land does? At Whittier we got into one of the newly constructed county highways, and at 3.30 p.m. we were home again, after four days in the open four days of pure and unadulterated happiness end of a motor trip in san diego's back country by j a graves of lightning and the method now used in america 
of securing buildings and persons from its mischievous effects by benjamin franklin this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org experiments made in electricity first gave philosophers a suspicion that the matter of lightning was the same with the electric matter Experiments afterwards made on lightning, obtained from the clouds by pointed rods, received into bottles, and subjected to every trial, have since proved this suspicion to be perfectly well founded, and that whatever properties we find in electricity are also the properties of lightning. This matter of lightning, or of electricity, is an extreme subtle fluid, penetrating other bodies, and subsisting in them, equally diffused when by any operation of art or nature there happens to be a greater proportion of this fluid in one body than in another the body which has most will communicate to that which has least till the proportion becomes equal provided the distance between them be not too great or if it is too great till there be proper conductors to convey it from one to the other if the communication be through the air without any conductor, a bright light is seen between the bodies, and a sound is heard. In our small experiments we call this light and sound, the electric spark and snap. But in the great operations of nature, the light is what we call lightning, and the sound, produced at the same time, though generally arriving later at our ears than the light does to our eyes, is, with its echoes, called thunder. If the communication of this fluid is by a conductor, it may be without either light or sound, the subtle fluid passing in the substance of the conductor. If the conductor be good and of sufficient bigness, the fluid passes through it without hurting it. If otherwise, it is damaged or destroyed. All metals and water are good conductors. Other bodies may become conductors by having some quantity of water in them as wood and other materials used in building but not having much water in them they are not good conductors and therefore are often damaged in the operation glass wax silk wool hair feathers and even wood perfectly dry are non-conductors that is they resist instead of facilitating the passage of this subtle fluid when this fluid has an opportunity of passing through two conductors, one good and sufficient, as of metal, the other not so good, it passes in the best and will follow it in any direction. The distance at which a body charged with this fluid will discharge itself suddenly, striking through the air into another body that is not charged, or not so highly charged, is different according to the quantity of the fluid the dimensions and form of the bodies themselves, and the state of the air between them. This distance, whatever it happens to be between any two bodies, is called their striking distance, as till they come within that distance of each other, no stroke will be made. The clouds have often more of this fluid in proportion than the earth, in which case as soon as they come near enough, that is, within the striking distance, or meet with a conductor, the fluid quits them and strikes into the earth. A cloud fully charged with this fluid, if so high as to be beyond the striking distance from the earth, passes quietly without making noise or giving light, unless it meets with other clouds that have less. Tall trees and lofty buildings, as the towers and spires of churches, become sometimes conductors between the clouds and the earth, but not being good ones, that is, not conveying the fluid freely, they are often damaged. Buildings that have their roofs covered with lead or other metal, and spouts of metal continued from the roof into the ground to carry off the water, are never hurt by lightning, as whenever it falls on such a building, it passes in the metals and not in the walls. When other buildings happen to be within the striking distance from such clouds, the fluid passes in the walls whether of wood, brick or stone, quitting the walls only when it can find better conductors near them, as metal rods, 
bolts, and hinges of windows or doors, gilding on wainscot, or frames of pictures, the silvering on the backs of looking glasses, the wires for bells, and the bodies of animals as containing watery fluids, and, in passing through the house it follows the direction of these conductors, taking as many in its way as can assist it in its passage, whether in a straight or crooked line, leaping from one to the other, if not far distant from each other, only rending the wall in the spaces where these partial good conductors are too distant from each other. An iron rod being placed on the outside of a building, from the highest part continued down to the moist earth, in any direction straight or crooked, following the form of the roof or other parts of the building, will receive the lightning at its upper end, attracting it so as to prevent it striking any other part, and, affording it a good conveyance into the earth, will prevent its damaging any part of the building. A small quantity of metal is found able to conduct a great quantity of this fluid. A wire no bigger than a goose quill has been known to conduct, with safety to the building as far as the wire was continued, a quantity of lightning that did prodigious damage both above and below it, and probably larger rods are not necessary, though it is common in America to make them of half an inch, some of three quarters, or an inch diameter. The rod may be fastened to the wall, chimney, etc., with staples of iron. The lightning will not leave the rod, a good conductor, to pass into the wall, a bad conductor, through those staples. It would rather, if any were in the wall, pass out of it into the rod to get more readily by that conductor into the earth. If the building be very large and extensive, two or more rods may be placed at different parts for greater security. Small ragged parts of clouds suspended in the air between the great body of clouds and the earth, like leaf gold in electrical experiments, often serve as partial conductors for the lightning, which proceeds from one of them to another, and, by their help, comes within the striking distance to the earth or a building. It therefore strikes through those conductors a building that would otherwise be out of the striking distance. Long, sharp points communicating with the earth, and presented to such parts of clouds, drawing silently from the fluid they are charged with, they are then attracted to the cloud, and may leave the distance so great as to be beyond the reach of striking. It is therefore that we elevate the upper end of the rod six or eight feet above the highest part of the building, tapering it gradually to a fine sharp point, which is gilt to prevent its rusting. Thus, the pointed rod either prevents a stroke from the cloud, or, if a stroke is made, conducts it to the earth with safety to the building. The lower end of the rod should enter the earth so deep as to come at the moist part, perhaps two or three feet, and, if bent when under the surface so as to go in a horizontal line six or eight feet from the wall, and then bent again downwards three or four feet, it will prevent damage to any of the stones of the foundation. A person apprehensive of danger from lightning, happening during the time of thunder to be in a house not so secured, will do well to avoid sitting near the chimney, near a looking glass, or any gilt pictures or wainscot. The safest place is in the middle of the room, so it be not under a metal luster suspended by a chain, sitting in one chair and laying the feet up in another. It is still safer to bring two or three mattresses or beds into the middle of the room, and folding them up double, place the chair upon them. For they not being so good conductors as the walls, the lightning will not choose an interrupted course through the air of the room and the bedding, when it can go through a continued better conductor, the wall. But where it can be had, a hammock or swinging bed, suspended by silk cords equally distant from the walls on every side, and from the ceiling and floor above and below, affords the safest situation a person can have in any room whatever, and what indeed may be deemed quite free from danger of any stroke by lightning. Paris, September, 1767. B.F. End of Of Lightning and the Method, now used in America, 
of securing buildings and persons from its mischievous effects by benjamin franklin read by mr frerking on hieracium hybrids obtained by artificial fertilization by gregor mendel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org on hieracium hybrids obtained by artificial fertilization by gregor mendel although i have already undertaken many experiments in fertilization between species of hieracium i have only succeeded in obtaining the following six hybrids and only from one to three specimens of them h auricula female crossed to h aurantiacum male h auricula female crossed to h pilosella male h auricula female crossed to h pratense male h echioides female crossed to h aurantiacum male footnote the plant used in this experiment is not exactly the typical h echioides it appears to belong to the series transitional to h prealtum but approaches more nearly to h echioides and for this reason was reckoned as belonging to the latter and footnote h prealtum female crossed to h flagellare male h prealtum female crossed to h aurantiacum male the difficulty of obtaining a larger number of hybrids is due to the minuteness of the flowers and their peculiar structure on account of this circumstance it was seldom possible to remove the anthers from the flowers chosen for fertilization without either letting pollen get on to the stigma or injuring the pistil so that it withered away as is well known the anthers are united to form a tube which closely embraces the pistil as soon as the flower opens the stigma already covered with pollen protrudes in order to prevent self-fertilization the anther tube must be taken out before the flower opens and for this purpose the bud must be slit up with a fine needle if this operation is attempted at a time when the pollen is mature which is the case two or three days before the flower opens it is seldom possible to prevent self-fertilization for with every care it is not easily possible to prevent a few pollen grains getting scattered and communicated to the stigma no better result has been obtained hitherto by removing the anthers at an earlier stage of development before the approach of maturity the tender pistil and stigma are exceedingly sensitive to injury and even if they are not actually injured they generally wither and dry up after a little time if deprived of their protecting investments i hope to obviate this last misfortune by placing the plants after the operation for two or three days in the damp atmosphere of a greenhouse an experiment lately made with h auricula treated in this way gave a good result to indicate the object with which these fertilization experiments were undertaken I venture to make some preliminary remarks respecting the genus Hieracium. This genus possesses such an extraordinary profusion of distinct forms that no other genus of plants can compare with it. Some of these forms are distinguished by special peculiarities and may be taken as type forms of species, while all the rest represent intermediate and transitional forms by which the type forms are connected together the difficulty in the separation and delimination of these forms has demanded the close attention of the experts regarding no other genus has so much been written or have so many and such fierce controversies arisen without as yet coming to a definite conclusion it is obvious that no general understanding can be arrived at so long as the value and significance of the intermediate and transitional forms are unknown Regarding the question whether and to what extent hybridization plays a part in the production of this wealth of forms, we find very various and conflicting views held by leading botanists. 
while some of them maintain that this phenomenon has a far-reaching influence others for example fries will have nothing to do with hybrids in hierarchia others take up an intermediate position and while granting that hybrids are not rarely formed between the species in a wild state still maintain that no great importance is to be attached to the fact on the ground that they are only of short duration the suggested causes of this are partly their restricted fertility or complete sterility partly also the knowledge obtained by experiment that in hybrids self-fertilization is always prevented if pollen of one of the parent forms reaches the stigma on these grounds it is regarded as inconceivable that hierarchium hybrids can constitute and maintain themselves as fully fertile and constant forms when growing near the progenitors the question of the origin of the numerous and constant intermediate forms has recently acquired no small interest since a famous hierarchium specialist has in the spirit of the darwinian teaching defended the view that these forms are to be regarded as arising from the transmutation of lost or still existing species from the nature of the subject it is clear that without an exact knowledge of the structure and fertility of the hybrids and the condition of their offspring through several generations no one can undertake to determine the possible influence exercised by hybridization over the multiplicity of intermediate forms in hierarchium the condition of the hierarchium hybrids in the range we are concerned with must necessarily be determined by experiments for we do not possess a complete theory of hybridization and we may be led into erroneous conclusions if we take rules deducted from observation of certain other hybrids to be laws of hybridization and try to apply them to hierarchium without further consideration if by the experimental method we can obtain a sufficient insight into the phenomenon of hybridization in hierarchium then by the help of the experience which has been collected respecting the structural relations of the wild forms a satisfactory judgment in regard to this question may become possible thus we may express the object which was sought after in these experiments i venture now to relate the very slight results which i have as yet obtained with reference to this object one respecting the structure of the hybrids we have to record the striking phenomenon that the forms hitherto obtained by similar fertilization are not identical the hybrids h prealtum female crossed to h aurantiacum male and h auricula female crossed to h aurantiacum male are each represented by two and h auricula female crossed to h pratense male by three individuals while as to the remainder only one of each has been obtained if we compare the individual characters of the hybrids with the corresponding characters of the two parent types we find that they sometimes present an intermediate structure but are sometimes so near to one of the parent characters that the corresponding character of the other has receded considerably or almost evades observation so for instance we see in one of the two forms of h auricula female crossed to h aurantiacum male pure yellow disc florets only the petals of the marginal florets are on the outside tinged with red to a scarcely noticeable degree in the other on the contrary the color of these florets comes very near to h aurantiacum only in the center of the disc the orange red passes into a deep golden yellow this difference is noteworthy for the flower color in hierarchium has the value of a constant character other similar cases are to be found in the leaves the peduncles etc if the hybrids are compared with the parent types as regards the sum total of their characters then the two forms of h prealtum female crossed to h aurantiacum male constitute approximately intermediate forms which do not agree in certain characters 
on the contrary in h auricula female crossed to h aurantiacum male and in h auricula female crossed to h pratense male we see the forms widely divergent so that one of them is nearer to the one and the other to the other parental type while in the case of the last named hybrid there is still a third which is almost precisely intermediate between them the conviction is then forced on us that we have here only single terms in an unknown series which may be formed by the direct action of the pollen of one species on the axials of another. 2. With a single exception, the hybrids in question form seeds capable of germination. H. echioides, female, crossed to H. aurantiacum, male, may be described as fully fertile h prealtum female crossed to h flagellare male as fertile h prealtum female crossed to h aurantiacum male and h auricula female crossed to h pratense male as partially fertile h auricula female crossed to h pilosella male as slightly fertile and H. auricula female crossed to H. aurantiacum male as infertile. Of the two forms of the last named hybrid, the red flowered one was completely sterile, but from the yellow flowered one a single well formed seed was obtained. Moreover, it must not pass unmentioned that among the seedlings of the partially fertile hybrid H. prealtum female crossed to H. aurantiacum male there was one plant which possessed full fertility. 3. As yet the offspring produced by self-fertilization of the hybrids have not varied, but agree in their characters, both with each other and with the hybrid plant from which they were derived. From H. prealtum, female, crossed to H. flagellare, male, two generations have flowered from h echioides female crossed to h aurantiacum male h prealtum female crossed to h aurantiacum male h auricula female crossed to h pilosella male one generation in each case has flowered four the fact must be declared that in the case of the fully fertile hybrid H. echioides female crossed to H. aurantiacum male, the pollen of the parent types was not able to prevent self-fertilization, though it was applied in great quantity to the stigmas protruding through the anther tubes when the flowers opened. From two flower heads treated in this way, seedlings were produced resembling this hybrid plant. A very similar experiment, carried out this summer with the partially fertile H. prealtum female crossed to H. aurantiacum male, led to the conclusion that those flower heads in which pollen of the parent type or of some other species had been applied to the stigmas, developed a notably larger number of seeds than those which had been left to self-fertilization alone the explanation of this result must only be sought in the circumstance that as a large part of the pollen grains of the hybrid examined microscopically show a defective structure a number of egg cells capable of fertilization do not become fertilized by their own pollen in the ordinary course of self-fertilization it not rarely happens that in fully fertile species in the wild state the formation of the pollen fails and in many anthers not a single good grain is developed. If in these cases seeds are nevertheless formed, such fertilization must have been effected by foreign pollen. In this way, hybrids may easily arise by reason of the fact that many forms of insects, notably the industrial Hymenoptera, visit the flowers of Hieracia with great zeal and are responsible for the pollen which easily sticks to their hairy bodies, reaching the stigmas of neighboring plants. From the few facts that I am able to contribute, it will be evident the work scarcely extends beyond its first inception. I must express some scruple in describing in this place an account of experiments just begun. 
but the conviction that the prosecution of the proposed experiments will demand a whole series of years and the uncertainty whether it will be granted to me to bring the same to a conclusion have determined me to make the present communication by the kindness of dr Nageli, the munich director who was good enough to send me species which were wanting especially from the alps i am in a position to include a larger number of forms in my experiments i venture to hope even next year to be able to contribute something more by way of extension and confirmation of the present account if finally we compare the described result still very uncertain with those obtained by crosses made between forms of pisum which i had the honour of communicating in the year eighteen sixty five we find a very real distinction in pisum the hybrids obtained from the immediate crossing of two forms have in all cases the same type but their posterity on the contrary are variable and follow a definite law in their variations in hieracium according to the present experiments the exactly opposite phenomenon seems to be exhibited already in describing the pisum experiments it was remarked that there are also hybrids whose posterity do not vary and that for example according to vitura the hybrids of salix reproduce themselves like pure species in hieracium we may take it we have a similar case whether from this circumstance we may venture to draw the conclusion that the polymorphism of the genera salix and hieracium is connected with the special condition of their hybrids is still an open question which may well be raised but not as yet answered End of On Hieracium Hybrids Obtained by Artificial Fertilization by Gregor Mendel Read by Avaii in July 2010
They stand nervously idle, feeling that they are taking up valuable space in an industrial establishment and should perhaps make a purchase. So they permit their eyes to drift politely toward the wares. And then the chatter of the books has them. Old books, new books, live books, dead books, but they move carelessly away and toward the bargain tables. All books, thirty cents. Broken down best sellers here, pausing in their gavotte toward oblivion. The next step is the junk man, one dollar a hundred. Pemberton's, Wright's, Farnall's, Webster's, Johnstone's, Porter's, Ward's, and a hundred other names reminiscent more of a page in the telephone book than a page out of a literary yesterday. The little gavotte is an old dance in the second-hand bookstore. The two-dollar shelf, the one-dollar rack, the seventy-five-cent table, the thirty-cent grab counter, and fini, new scribblings crowd for place, old scribblings exeunt. The girl without an umbrella studies titles, a love story, of course, and only thirty cents. An opened page reads, He took her in his arms. Who would not buy such a book on a rainy day? It rains and other people come in. A middle-aged man in a curious coat, a curious hat, and a curious face. Slate-colored skin, slate-colored eyes behind silver spectacles. A scholar in caricature. An old clothes dealer out of Alice in Wonderland. The rain runs from his stringy, slate-colored hair. He approaches the high shelves, thrusts the silver spectacles farther down on his nose. In front of him a curious row of literary gargoyles. The astral light. What and where is God? Man, by Dohony of Texas, the star of the Magi. Thin, slate-colored fingers fumble nervously over the title-backs. A second man, figure short, squat, red-faced, crowds the erratic scholar. A third. The rain is bringing them in in numbers. These are the basement students of the gargoyle philosophies, the gargoyle sciences, the gargoyle religions, perpetual motion machine inventors, alchemists with staring, nervous-eyed medieval faces, fourth-dimensionists, sun-worshippers, kabbalistic researchers, voodoo authorities. The old bookstore is suddenly alive with them. They move about furtively with no word for one another, lost in their grotesque dreamings. On a rainy day the city gives them up, and they come puttering excitedly into the loop on a quest. The world is a garish unreality to them. The streets and the crowds of automatic-faced men and women, the upward rush of buildings and the horizontal rush of traffic are no more than vague grimacings. Life is something of which the streets are oblivious. But here, on the gargoyle shelves, the high, shadowed shelves of the old bookstore, truth stands in all its terrible reality, wrapped in its authentic haplements. Dr. Hickson of the psychopathic laboratory would give these curious rainy-day fantasists identities as weird as the volumes they caress. But the old bookstore clerk is more kind. He lets them rummage. Before the rain ends, they will buy the cradle of giants, the key to Satanism, Cornelius Agrippa's natural magic, the astral cord, occultism and its usages. They will buy books by Jacob Bohem, William Law, Sadler, Hyslop, Rama Chaska, and they will go hurrying home with their treasures pressed close to them, stuffy bedrooms lined with hints of sabbatical horror, strewn with bizarre refuse. Musty-smelling books, out of whose pages fantastic shapes rear themselves against the gaslights. Macabre worlds in which unreason rides like a headless D'Artagnan. Evenings in the park arguing suddenly with startled strangers on the existence of the Philosopher's Stone or the astrological causes of influenza. These form a background for the curious men whom the rain has drifted into the old bookstore, and who stand with their eyes haunting the gargoyle titles. The rain brings in another tribesman, a famed, though somewhat ragged, bibliomaniac. His casual gestures hide the sudden fever old books kindle in his thought. Old books, old books, a magical phrase to him. 
His eyes travel like a lover's back and forth, up and down. He knows them all, the sets, the first editions, the bargains, the riffraff. A democratic lover is here. But the clerk watches him, for this lover is an antagonist. Yes, this somewhat ragged, gleaming-eyed gentleman with the casual manner is a terrible person to have around in a second-hand bookstore on a rainy day. Only six months ago one of his horrible tribe pounced upon Sandler's Indian Wars. Price, thirty cents. Value, alas, one hundred and fifty dollars. Only two months ago another of his kidney fell upon a copy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Emile, with Jean's own dedication on the title page to his majesty, the King of France. Price, seventy-five cents. Value, gadzooks, two hundred dollars. There will be nothing today, however, merely an hour's caress of old friends on the high shelves while the rain beats outside. Unless, unless this Stevenson happens by any chance to be a first. A furtive glance at the title page. No. The clerk sighs with relief as the Stevenson goes back on the shelf. It might have been something overlooked. The rain ends. The old bookstore slowly empties. A troop of men and women saunter out, pausing to say farewell to the gaudily ragged tomes in the old bookstore. The sky has grown lighter. The buildings shake the last drops of rain from their spatula tops. There is a different-looking, well-linened gentleman thrusts his head into the old bookstore and inquires, Have you got a copy of the Investor's Guide? End of Pandora's Box by Ben Hecht The Scout Law From Boy Scouts of America a Handbook of Woodcraft, Scouting, and Lifecraft, 1910. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Scout Law 1. A Scout's Honor is to be Trusted If a Scout says, On my honor it is so, it means that it is so, just as if he had taken the most solemn oath. Similarly, if a scout officer says to a scout, I trust you on your honor to do this, the scout is bound to carry out the order to the very best of his ability, and to let nothing interfere with his doing so. If a scout were to break his honor by telling a lie, or by not carrying out an order exactly when trusted on his honor to do so, he may be directed to hand over a scout badge, and never wear it again. He may also be directed to cease to be a scout. 2. A scout is loyal to the president and to his officers, and to his parents, his country, and his employers. He must stick to them through thick and thin, against anyone who is their enemy, or who even talks badly of them. 3. A scout's duty is to be useful and to help others. And he is to do his duty before anything else, even though he gives up his own pleasure, or comfort, or safety to do it. When in difficulty to know which of two things to do, he must ask himself, which is my duty? that is, which is best for other people, and do that one. He must be prepared at any time to save life, or to help injured persons, and he must try his best to do a good turn to somebody every day. 4. A scout is a friend to all, and a brother to every other scout, no matter to what social class the other belongs. Thus, if a scout meets another scout, even though a stranger to him, he must speak to him, and help him in any way that he can, either to carry out the duty he is then doing, or by giving him food, or, as far as possible, anything that he may be in want of. A scout must never be a snob. A snob is one who looks down upon another because he is poor, or who is poor and resents another because he is rich. A scout accepts the other man as he finds him, and makes the best of him. Kim, the Boy Scout, was called by the Hindus, little friend of all the world and that is the name that every scout should earn for himself. 5. A scout is courteous, that is, he is polite to all, but especially to women and children, and old people, and invalids, cripples, etc. And he must not take any reward for being helpful or courteous. 6. A scout is a friend to animals. He should save them as far as possible from pain, 
and should not kill any animal unnecessarily, even if it is only a fly, for it is one of God's creatures. Killing an animal for food is allowable. 7. A scout obeys orders of his parents, patrol leader, or scoutmaster without question. Even if he gets an order he does not like, he must do as soldiers and sailors do. He must carry it out all the same, because it is his duty. And after he has done it, he can come and state any reasons against it. But he must carry out the order at once. That is discipline. 8. A scout smiles and looks pleasant under all circumstances. When he gets an order, he should obey it cheerily and readily, not in a slow, hangdog sort of way. Scouts never grumble at hardships, nor whine at each other, nor swear when put out. When you just miss a train, or someone treads on your favorite corn, not that a scout ought to have such things as corns, or under any annoying circumstances, you should force yourself to smile at once, and then whistle a tune, and you will be all right. A scout goes about with a smile on. It cheers him and cheers other people, especially in time of danger, for he keeps it up then all the same. The punishment for swearing or using bad language is, for each offense, a mug of cold water to be poured down the offender's sleeve by the other scouts. It was the punishment invented by the old British scout, Captain John Smith, 300 years ago. 9. A scout is thrifty, that is, he saves every penny he can, and puts it into the bank, so that he may have money to keep himself when out of work, and thus not make himself a burden to others or that he may have money to give away to others when they need it. End of The Scout Law Recording by James Christopher jxchristopher at yahoo.com August 2010
if accident or monopoly sometimes raised the value even above the standard of aurelian the manufacturers of tyre and berytus were sometimes compelled by the operation of the same causes to content themselves with a ninth part of that extravagant rate a law was thought necessary to discriminate the dress of comedians from that of senators and of the silk exported from its native country the far greater part was consumed by the subjects of justinian they were still more intimately acquainted with a shellfish of the mediterranean surnamed the silkworm of the sea the fine wool or hair by which the mother of pearl affixes itself to the rock is now manufactured for curiosity rather than use and a robe obtained from the same singular materials was the gift of the roman emperor to the satraps of armenia a valuable merchandise of small bulk is capable of defraying the expense of land carriage and the caravans traversed the whole latitude of asia in two hundred and forty-three days from the chinese ocean to the sea-coast of syria silk was immediately delivered to the romans by the persian merchants who frequented the fairs of armenia and nisibis but this trade which in the intervals of truce was oppressed by avarice and jealousy was totally interrupted by the long wars of the rival monarchies the great king might proudly number sogdiana and even serica among the provinces of his empire but his real dominion was bounded by the oxus and his useful intercourse with the sogdoites beyond the river depended on the pleasure of their conquerors the white huns and the turks who successfully reigned over that industrious people yet the most savage dominion has not extirpated the seeds of agriculture and commerce in a region which is celebrated as one of the four gardens of asia the cities of samarkand and bochara are advantageously seated for this exchange of its various productions and their merchants purchase from the chinese the raw or manufactured silk which they transported into persia for the use of the roman empire in the vain capital of china the sogdian caravans were entertained as the suppliant embassies of tributary kingdoms and if they returned in safety the bold adventure was rewarded with exorbitant gain but the difficult and perilous march from samarkand to the first town of shensi could not be performed in less than sixty eighty or one hundred days as soon as they had passed the jaxartes they entered the desert and the wandering hordes unless they are restrained by armies and garrisons have always considered the citizen and the traveller as the objects of lawful rapine to escape the tartar robbers and the tyrants of persia the silk caravans explored a more southern road they traversed the mountains of tibet descended the streams of the ganges or the indus and patiently expected in the ports of guzerat and malabar the annual fleets of the west but the dangers of the desert were found less intolerable than toil hunger and the loss of time the attempt was seldom renewed and the only european who has passed that unfrequented way applauds his own diligence that in nine months after his departure from peking he reached the mouth of the indus the ocean however was open to the free communication of mankind from the great river to the tropic of cancer the provinces of china were subdued and civilized by the emperors of the north they were filled about the same time of the christian era with cities and men mulberry trees and their precious inhabitants and if the chinese with a knowledge of the compass had possessed the genius of the greeks or phoenicians they might have spread their discoveries over the southern hemisphere i am not qualified to examine and i am not disposed to believe their distant voyages to the persian gulf or the cape of good hope but their ancestors might equal the labors and success of the present race and the sphere of their navigation might extend from the isles of japan to the straits of malacca the pillars if we may apply that name of an oriental hercules without losing sight of land they might sail along the coast to the extreme promontory of aiken which is annually visited by ten or twelve ships laden with the productions the manufactures and even the artificers of china the island of sumatra and the opposite peninsula 
are faintly delineated as the regions of gold and silver and the trading cities named in the geography of ptolemy may indicate that this wealth was not solely derived from the mines the direct interval between sumatra and ceylon is about three hundred leagues the chinese and indian navigators were conducted by the flight of birds in periodical winds and the ocean might be securely traversed in square-built ships which instead of iron were sewed together with the strongest thread of the coconut ceylon serendib or taprobana was divided between two hostile princes one of whom possessed the mountains the elephants and the luminous carbuncle and the other enjoyed the more solid riches of domestic industry foreign trade and the capacious harbor of trinquemal which received and dismissed the fleets of the east and west in this hospitable isle at an equal distance as it was computed from their respective countries the silk merchants of china who had collected in their voyages aloes cloves nutmeg and sandalwood maintained a free and beneficial commerce with the inhabitants of the persian gulf the subjects of the great king exalted without rival his power and magnificence and the roman who confounded their vanity by comparing his paltry coin with the gold medal of the emperor anastasius had sailed to ceylon in an ethiopian ship as a simple passenger as silk became of indispensable use the emperor justinian saw with concern that the persians had occupied by land and sea the monopoly of this important supply and that the wealth of his subjects was continually drained by a nation of enemies and idolaters an active government would have restored the trade of egypt and the navigation of the red sea which had decayed with the prosperity of the empire and the roman vessels might have sailed for the purchase of silk to the ports of ceylon or malacca or even of china justinian embraced a more humble expedient and solicited the aid of his christian allies the ethiopians of abyssinia who had recently acquired the arts of navigation the spirit of trade and the seaport of adulis still decorated with the trophies of a grecian conqueror along the african coast they penetrated to the equator in search of gold emeralds and aromatics but they wisely declined an unequal competition in which they must be always prevented by the vicinity of the persians to the markets of india and the emperor submitted to the disappointment till his wishes were gratified by an unexpected event the gospel had been preached to the indians a bishop already governed the christians of st thomas on the pepper coast of malabar a church was planted in ceylon and the missionaries pursued the footsteps of commerce to the extremities of asia two persian monks had long resided in china perhaps in the royal city of nanking the seat of a monarch addicted to foreign superstitions and who actually received an embassy from the isle of ceylon amidst their pious occupations they viewed with a curious eye the common dress of the chinese the manufactures of silk and the myriads of silkworms whose education either on trees or in houses had once been considered as the labor of queens they soon discovered that it was impracticable to transport the short-lived insect but that in the eggs a numerous progeny might be preserved and multiplied in a distant climate religion or interest had more power over the persian monks than the love of their country after a long journey they arrived at constantinople imparted their project to the emperor and were liberally encouraged by the gifts and promises of justinian to the historians of that prince a campaign at the foot of mount caucasus had seemed more deserving of a minute relation than the labors of these missionaries of commerce who again entered china deceived a jealous people by concealing the eggs of the silkworm in a hollow cane and returned in triumph with the spoils of the east under their direction the eggs were hatched at the proper season by the artificial heat of dung the worms were fed with mulberry leaves they lived and labored in a foreign climate a sufficient number of butterflies were saved to propagate the race and trees were planted to supply the nourishment of the rising generations experience in reflection corrected the errors of a new attempt and the Sauduite ambassadors 
acknowledged in the succeeding reign that the romans were not inferior to the natives of china in the education of the insects and the manufactures of silk in which both china and constantinople had been surpassed by the industry of modern europe i am not insensible of the benefits of elegant luxury yet i reflect with some pain that if the importers of silk had introduced the art of printing already practised by the chinese the comedies of menander and the entire decades of livy would have been perpetuated in the editions of the sixth century End of Silk by Edward Gibbon War is a racket. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. War is a Racket by Major General Smedley Butler Introduction Smedley Darling Butler Born Westchester, Pennsylvania, July 30, 1881 Educated Harvard Ford School Married Ethel C. Peters of Philadelphia, June 30, 1905 Awarded two Congressional Medals of Honor. One, the capture of Veracruz, Mexico, 1914. Two, capture of Fort Riviere, Haiti, 1917. Distinguished Service Medal, 1919. Retired October 1st, 1931 on leave of absence to act as director of safety philadelphia 1932 lecture 1930s republican candidate for senate 1932 died at naval hospital philadelphia june 21 1940 for more information about major general butler contact the United States Marine Corps. Chapter 1 War is a Racket War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which profits are reckoned in dollars and losses in lives. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to the majority of the people. Only a small inside group knows what it is all about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. Out of war, a few people make huge fortunes. In World War I, a mere handful garnered the profits of the conflict. At least 21,000 new millionaires and billionaires were made in the United States during the World War. That many admitted huge blood gains in their income tax returns. How many other war millionaires falsified their tax returns, no one knows. How many of these war millionaires shouldered a rifle? How many of them dug a trench? How many of them knew what it meant to go hungry in a rat-infested dugout? How many of them spent sleepless, frightened nights ducking shells and shrapnel and machine-gun bullets? How many of them parried a bayonet thrust of an enemy? How many of them were wounded or killed in battle? Out of war, nations acquire additional territory if they are victorious. They just take it. This newly acquired territory promptly is exploited by the few, the selfsame few who wrung dollars out of the blood in the war. The general public shoulders the bill. And what is this bill? This bill renders horrible accounting, newly placed gravestones, mangled bodies, shattered minds, broken hearts and homes, economic instability depression and all its attendant miseries, 
back-breaking taxation for generations and generations. For a great many years, as a soldier, I had a suspicion that war was a racket. Not until I retired to civilian life did I fully realize it. Now that I see the international war clouds gathering as they are today, I must face it and speak out. Again they are choosing sides. France and Russia met and agreed to stand side by side. Italy and Austria hurried to make a similar agreement. Poland and Germany cast sheep eyes at each other, forgetting for the nonce their dispute over the Polish corridor. The assassination of King Alexander of Yugoslavia complicated matters. Yugoslavia and Hungary, long bitter enemies, were almost at each other's throats. Italy was ready to jump in, but France was waiting, so was Czechoslovakia. All of them are looking ahead to war. Not the people, not those who fight and pay and die, only those who foment wars and remain safely at home to profit. There are 40 million men under arms in the world today, and our statesmen and diplomats have the temerity to say that war is not in the making. Hell's bells, are these 40 million men being trained to be dancers? Not in Italy, to be sure. Premier Mussolini knows what they are being trained for. He at least is frank enough to speak out. Only the other day, El Duce, in International Conciliation, the publication of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, said, And above all, fascism, the more it considers and observes the future and the development of humanity, quite apart from political considerations of the moment, believes neither in the possibility nor the utility of perpetual peace. War alone brings up to its highest tension all human energy and puts the stamp of nobility upon the people who have the courage to meet it. Undoubtedly, Mussolini means exactly what he says. His well-trained army, his great fleet of planes, and even his navy are ready for war anxious for it apparently his recent stand at the side of hungary in the latter's dispute with yugoslavia showed that and the hurried mobilization of his troops in the austrian border after the assassination of dolphus showed it too there are others in europe too whose saber-rattling presages war sooner or later Herr Hitler, with his rearming Germany and his constant demands for more and more arms, is an equal if not greater menace to peace. France only recently increased the terms of military service for its youth from a year to 18 months. Yes, all over, nations are camping in their arms. The mad dogs of Europe are on the loose. The, in the Orient, the maneuvering is more adroit. Back in 1904, when Russia and Japan fought, we kicked out our old friends, the Russians, and backed Japan. Then our very generous international bankers were financing Japan. Now the trend is to poison us against the Japanese. What does the open-door policy to China mean to us? Our trade with China is about $90 million a year. Or the Philippine Islands. We have spent about $600 million in the Philippines in 35 years, and we, our bankers and industrialists and speculators, have private investments there of less than $200 million. Then, to save that China trade of about $90 million, or to protect these private investments of less than $200 million in the Philippines, we would be all stirred up to hate Japan and go to war. A war that might well cost us tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of lives of Americans, and many more hundreds of thousands of physically maimed and mentally unbalanced men. Of course, for this loss, there would be a compensating profit. Fortunes would be made. Millions and billions of dollars would be piled up by a few munitions makers. Bankers, shipbuilders, manufacturers, 
meatpackers, speculators, they would fare well. Yes, they are getting ready for another war. Why shouldn't they? It pays high dividends. But what does it profit the men who are killed? What does it profit their mothers and sisters, their wives and their sweethearts? What does it profit their children? What does it profit anyone except the very few to whom war means huge profits? Yes, and what does it profit the nation? Take our own case. Until 1898, we didn't own a bit of territory outside the mainland of North America. At that time, our national debt was a little more than one trillion dollars. Then we became internationally minded. We forgot or shunted aside the advice of the father of our country. We forgot George Washington's warning about entangling alliances. We went to war. We acquired outside territory. At the end of the World War period, as a direct result of our fiddling in international affairs, our national debt had jumped to over $25 billion. Our total favorable trade balance during the 25-year period was about $24 billion. Therefore, on a purely bookkeeping basis, we ran a little behind year for year, and that foreign trade might well have been ours without the wars. It would have been far cheaper, not to say safer, for the average American who pays the bills to stay out of foreign entanglements. For a very few, this racket, like bootlegging and other underworld rackets, brings fancy profits, but the cost of operations is always transferred to the people who do not profit. Chapter 2. Who Makes the Profits? The World War, rather our brief participation in it, has cost the United States some $52 billion. Figure it out. That means $400 to every American man, woman, and child. And we haven't paid the debt yet. We are paying it. Our children will pay it. And our children's children probably still will be paying the cost of that war. The normal profits of business concern in the United States are 6, 8, 10, and sometimes 12 percent. But wartime profits, ah, that is another matter. 20, 60, 100, 300, and even 1800 percent. The sky is the limit. All that traffic will bear. Uncle Sam has the money. Let's get it. Of course, it isn't put that crudely in wartime. It is dressed into speeches about patriotism, love of country, and we must all put our shoulders to the wheel. But the profits jump and leap and skyrocket and are safely pocketed. Let's just take a few examples. Take our friends the DuPonts, the powder people. Didn't one of them testify before a Senate committee recently that their powder won the war? Or saved the world for democracy or something? How did they do in the war? They were a patriotic corporation. Well, the average earnings of the DuPonts for the period of 1910 to 1914 were six million dollars a year. It wasn't much, but the DuPonts managed to get along on it. Now let's look at their average yearly profit during the war years, 1914 to 1918. Fifty-eight million dollars a year profit, we find, nearly ten times that of normal times, and the profits of normal times were pretty good, an increase in profits of more than 950 percent. Take one of our little steel companies that patriotically shunted aside the making of rails and girders and bridges to manufacture war materials. Well, their 1910 and 1914 yearly earnings averaged six million dollars. Then came the war, and like loyal citizens, Bethlehem Steel promptly turned to munitions making. Did their profits jump? Or did they let Uncle Sam in for a bargain? Well, their 1914 to 1918 average was $49 million a year. 
Or let's take United States Steel. The normal earnings during the five-year period prior to the war were $105 million a year. Not bad. Then along came the war and up went the profits. The average yearly profits for the period of 1914 to 1918 was $240 million. Not bad. There you have some of the steel and powder earnings. Let's look at something else. A little copper, perhaps. That always does well in war times. Anaconda, for instance. Average yearly earnings during the pre-war years, 1910 to 1914, of ten million dollars. During the war years of 1914 and 1918, profits leaped to thirty-four million dollars per year. Or Utah copper, average of five million dollars per year during the 1910-1914 period, jumped to an average of $21 million yearly profit for the war period. Let's group these five with three smaller companies. The total yearly average profits of the pre-war period, 1910 to 1914, were $137,480,000. Then along came the war. The average yearly profits for this group skyrocketed to 408 million 300,000. A little increase in profits of approximately 200 percent. Does war pay? It paid them. But they aren't the only ones. There are still others. Let's take leather. For the three-year period before the war, the total profits of Central Leather Company were three million five hundred thousand dollars. That was approximately one million one hundred sixty seven thousand dollars a year. Well, in nineteen sixteen Central Leather returned a profit of fifteen million dollars, a small increase of eleven hundred percent. That's all. The General Chemical Company averaged a profit for the three years before the war of a little over $800,000 a year. Came the war and the profits jumped to $12 million, a leap of 1,400%. International Nickel Company, and you can't have a war without nickel, showed an increase in profits from a mere average of $4 million a year to $73 million yearly. Not bad. An increase of more than 1,700%. American Sugar Refining Company averaged $2 million a year for the three years before the war. In 1916, a profit of $6 million was recorded. Listen to Senate document number 259 the 65th Congress reporting on corporate earnings and government revenues. Considering the profit of 122 meat packers, 153 cotton manufacturers, 299 garment makers, 49 steel plants, and 340 coal producers during the war, profits under 25 percent were exceptional. For instance, the coal companies made between 100% and 7,856% on their capital stock during the war. The Chicago Packers doubled and tripled their earnings. And let us not forget the bankers who financed the Great War. If anyone had the cream of the profits, it was the bankers. Being partnership rather than incorporated organizations, they did not have to report to stockholders, and their profits were as secret as they were immense. How the bankers made their millions and their billions, I do not know, because those little secrets never become public, even before a Senate investigatory body. But here's how some of the other patriotic industrialists and speculators chiseled their way into war profits. Take the shoe people. They like war. It brings business with abnormal profits. They make huge profits on sales abroad to our allies, perhaps like the munitions manufacturers and the armament makers they also sold to the enemy. 
for a dollar is a dollar whether it comes from germany or from france but they did well by uncle sam too for instance they sold uncle sam thirty-five million pairs of hobnailed service shoes there were four million soldiers eight pairs and more to a soldier my regiment during the war had only one pair to a soldier some of these shoes probably are still in existence they were good shoes but when the war was over uncle sam has a matter of twenty-five million pairs left over bought and paid for profits recorded and pocketed there was still lots of leather left so the leather people sold your uncle sam hundreds of thousands of mcclellan saddles for the cavalry but there wasn't any american cavalry overseas somebody had to get rid of this leather however somebody had to make a profit in it so we had lots of mcclellan saddles and we probably have those yet also somebody had a lot of mosquito netting they sold your uncle sam twenty million mosquito nets for the use of the soldiers overseas i suppose the boys were expected to put it over them as they tried to sleep in muddy trenches one hand scratching cooties on their backs and the other making passes at scurrying rats well not one of these mosquito nets ever got to france anyhow these thoughtful manufacturers wanted to make sure that no soldier would be without his mosquito net so forty million additional yards of mosquito netting were sold to uncle sam they were pretty good profits in mosquito netting in those days even if there were no mosquitoes in france i suppose if the war had lasted just a little longer the enterprising mosquito netting manufacturers would have sold your uncle sam a couple of consignments of mosquitoes to plant in france so that more mosquito netting would be in order airplane and engine manufacturers felt they too should get their just profits out of this war why not everybody else was getting theirs so one billion dollars count them if you live long enough was spent by uncle sam in building airplane engines that never left the ground not one plane or motor out of the billion dollars worth ordered ever got into battle in france just the same the manufacturers made their little profit of thirty one hundred or perhaps three hundred per cent undershirts for soldiers cost fourteen cents to make and uncle sam paid thirty cents to forty cents each for them a nice little profit for the undershirt manufacturer and the stocking manufacturer and the uniform manufacturers and the cap manufacturers and the steel helmet manufacturers all got theirs why when the war was over some four million sets of equipment knapsacks and things that go to fill them crammed warehouses on this side now they are being scrapped because the regulations have changed the contents but the manufacturers collected their wartime profits on them and they will do it all over again the next time there were lots of brilliant ideas for profit making during the war one very versatile patriot sold uncle sam twelve dozen forty-eight inch wrenches oh they were very nice wrenches the only trouble was that there was only one nut ever made that large enough for these wrenches that is the one that holds the turbines at niagara falls well after uncle sam had bought them and the manufacturer had pocketed the profit the wrenches were put on freight cars and shunted all around the united states in an effort to find a use for them when the armistice was signed it was indeed a sad blow to the wrench manufacturer he was just about to make some nuts to fit the wrenches then he planned to sell these too to your uncle sam still another had a brilliant idea that colonels shouldn't ride in automobiles nor should they even ride on horseback one has probably seen a picture of andy jackson riding in a buckboard 
Well, some six thousand buckboards were sold to Uncle Sam for the use of colonels. Not one of them was used, but the buckboard manufacturer got his war profit. The shipbuilders felt they should come in on some of it too. They built a lot of ships that made a lot of profit, more than three billion dollars worth. Some of the ships were all right, but six hundred and thirty-five million dollars worth of them were made of wood and wouldn't float. The seams opened up and they sank. We paid for them though, and somebody pocketed the profits. It has been estimated by statisticians and economists and researchers that the war cost your Uncle Sam $52 billion. Of this sum, $39 billion was expended in the actual war itself. This expenditure yielded $16 billion in profits. That is how the 21,000 billionaires and millionaires got that way. This $16 billion profit is not to be sneezed at. It is quite a tidy sum, and it went to a very few. The Senate Nye Committee probe of the munitions industry and its wartime profits, despite its sensational disclosures, hardly has scratched the surface. Even so, it has some effect. The State Department has been studying, for some time, methods of keeping out of war. The War Department suddenly decides it has a wonderful plan to spring. The administration names a committee. With the War and Navy Departments ably represented under the chairmanship of a Wall Street speculator, to limit profits in wartime, to what extent isn't suggested. Hmm. Possibly the profits of 300 and 600 and 1600 percent of those who turned blood into gold in the World War would be limited to some smaller figure. Apparently, however, the plan does not call for any limitation of losses. That is, the losses of those who fight the war. As far as I have been able to ascertain, there is nothing in the scheme to limit a soldier to the loss of but one eye or one arm, or to limit his wounds to one or two or three, or to limit the loss of life. There is nothing in this scheme, apparently, that says not more than 12% of the regiment should be wounded in battle, or that not more than 7% in a division shall be killed. Of course, the committee cannot be bothered with such trifling matters. Chapter 3 Who Pays the Bill? Who Provides the Profits? This nice little profits of 20, 100, 300, 1500, and 1800 percent, we all pay them in taxation. We pay the bankers their profits when we bought Liberty Bonds at $100 and sold them back at $84 or $86 to the bankers. These bankers collected $100 plus. It was a simple manipulation. The bankers controlled the security marts. It was easy for them to depress the price of these bonds. Then all of us, the people, got frightened and sold the bonds at $84 or $86. The bankers bought them. Then these same bankers stimulated a boom and government bonds went to par and above. Then the bankers collected their profits. But the soldier pays the biggest part of the bill. If you don't believe this, visit the American cemeteries on the battlefields abroad or visit any of the veteran hospitals in the United States. On a tour of the country, in the midst of which I am at the time of this writing, I have visited 18 government hospitals for veterans. In them are a total of about 50,000 destroyed men, men who were the pick of the nation 18 years ago. The very able chief surgeon at the government hospital at Milwaukee, where there are 3,800 of the living dead, 
told me that mortality among the veterans is three times as great as among those who stayed at home. Boys with normal viewpoints were taken out of the fields and offices and factories and classrooms and put into the ranks. There they were remolded. They were made over. They were made to above face to regard murder as the order of the day. They were put shoulder to shoulder and through mass psychology they were entirely changed. We used them for a couple of years and trained them to think nothing at all of the killing or of being killed. Then suddenly we discharged them and told them to make another about face. This time they had to do their own readjustment without mass psychology, without officers' aids and advice and without nationwide propaganda. We didn't need them anymore, so we scattered them about without any three-minute or liberty loan speeches or parades. Many, too many of these fine young boys are eventually destroyed mentally because they couldn't make that final about-face alone. In the government hospital in Marion, Indiana, 1,800 of these boys are in pens, 500 of them in a barracks with steel bars and wires all around outside the building and on the porches. These already have been mentally destroyed. These boys don't even look like human beings. Oh, the look on their faces. Physically, they are in good shape. Mentally, they are gone. There are thousands and thousands of these cases, and more and more are coming in all the time. The tremendous excitement of the war, the sudden cutting off of that excitement, the young boys couldn't stand it. That's a part of the bill, so much for the dead. They have paid their part of the war profits, so much for the mentally and physically wounded. They are paying now their share of the war profits, but the others paid too. They paid with heartbreaks when they tore themselves away from their firesides and their families to don the uniform of Uncle Sam, on which a profit had been made. They paid another part in the training camps where they were regimented and drilled while others took their jobs and their places in the lives of their communities. They paid for it in the trenches where they shot and were shot, where they were hungry for days at a time, where they slept in the mud and the cold and in the rain, with the moans and shrieks of the dying for a horrible lullaby. But don't forget, the soldier paid part of the dollars and cents too, up to and including the Spanish-American War. We had a prize system, and soldiers and sailors fought for money. During the Civil War, they were paid bonuses, in many instances before they went into service. The government or states paid as high as $1,200 for an enlistment. In the Spanish-American War they gave prize money. When we captured any vessels the soldiers all got their share. At least they were supposed to. Then it was found that we could reduce the cost of wars by taking all the prize money and keeping it. But conscripting drafting the soldier anyway. Then soldiers couldn't bargain for their labor. Everyone else could bargain, but the soldier couldn't. Napoleon once said, all men are enamored of decorations. They positively hunger for them. So by developing the Napoleonic system, the metal business, the government learned it could get soldiers for less money because the boys liked to be decorated. Until the Civil War, there was no medals. Then the Congressional Medal of Honor was handed out. It made enlistment easier. After the Civil War, no new medals were issued until the Spanish-American War. In the World War, we used propaganda to make the boys accept conscription. They were made to feel ashamed if they didn't join the army. So vicious was this propaganda that even God was brought into it. With few exceptions, our clergymen joined in the clamor to kill, kill, kill. 
to kill the Germans. God is on our side. It is his will that the Germans be killed. And in Germany, the good pastors called upon the Germans to kill the Allies, to please the same God. That was part of the general propaganda, built up to make people war-conscious and murder-conscious. Beautiful ideals were painted for our boys who were sent out to die. This was the war to end all wars. This was the war to make the world safe for democracy. No one mentioned to them as they marched away that their going and their dying would mean huge war profits. No one told these American soldiers that they might be shot down by bullets made by their own brothers here. No one told them that the ships on which they were going to cross might be torpedoed by submarines built with United States patents. They were just told it was to be a glorious adventure. Thus, having stuffed patriotism down their throats, it was decided to make them help pay for the war too. So we gave them the large salary of $30 a month. All they had to do for this munificent sum was to leave their dear ones behind, give up their jobs, live in swampy trenches, eat canned willy when they could get it, and kill and kill and kill and be killed. But wait, half of that wage, just a little more than a riveter in a shipyard or a laborer in a munitions factory safe at home made in a day, was promptly taken from him to support his dependents, so that they would not become a charge upon his community. Then we made him pay what amounted to accident insurance, something the employer pays for in an enlightened state, and that cost him six dollars a month. He had less than nine dollars a month left. Then, the most crowning insolence of all, he was virtually blackjacked into paying for his own ammunition, clothing, and food by being made to buy liberty bonds. Most soldiers got no money at all on paydays. We made them buy Liberty Bonds at a hundred dollars, and then we bought them back. When they came back from the war and couldn't find work, at eighty-four and eighty-six dollars. And the soldiers bought about two billion dollars worth of these bonds. Yes, the soldier pays the greater part of the bill. His family pays too. They pay in the same heartbreak that he does. As he suffers, they suffer. At nights, as he lay in the trenches and watched shrapnel burst about him, they lay home in their beds and tossed sleeplessly. His father, his mother, his wife, his sisters, his brothers, his sons, and his daughters. When he returned home, minus an eye, or minus a leg, or with his mind broken, they suffered too. As much as, and even sometimes more than he, Yes, and they, too, contributed their dollars to the profits of the munition makers and bankers and shipbuilders and the manufacturers and the speculators made. They, too, bought Liberty Bonds and contributed to the profit of the bankers after the armistice in the hocus-pocus of manipulated Liberty Bond prices. And even now the families of the wounded men and the mentally broken and those who never were able to readjust themselves are still suffering and still paying. Chapter 4 How to Smash This Racket Well, it's a racket all right. A few profit and the many pay. But there is a way to stop it. You can't end it by disarmament conferences. You can't eliminate it by peace parleys at Geneva. Well-meaning but impractical groups can't wipe it out by resolution. It can be smashed effectively only by taking the profit out of wars. The only way to smash this racket is to conscript capital and industry and labor before the nation's manhood can be conscripted. 
one month before the government can conscript the young men of the nation, it must conscript capital and industry and labor. Let the officers and the directors and the high-powered executives of our armament factories and our munitions makers and our shipbuilders and our airplane builders and the manufacturers of all the other things that provide profit in wartime as well as the bankers and the speculators be conscripted to get thirty dollars a month the same wage as the lads in the trenches get let the workers in these plants get the same wages all the workers, all presidents, all executives, all directors, all managers, all bankers, yes, and all generals and all admirals and all officers and all politicians and all government office holders, everyone in the nation be restricted to a total monthly income not to exceed that paid to the soldiers in the trenches. Let all these kings and tycoons and masters of business and all those workers in industry and all our senators and governors and majors pay half of their monthly $30 wage to their families and pay war risk insurance and buy liberty bonds. Why shouldn't they? They aren't running any risk of being killed or having their bodies mangled or their minds shattered. They aren't sleeping in muddy trenches. They aren't hungry. The soldiers are. Give capital and industry and labor 30 days to think it over and you will find by that time there will be no war. That will smash the war racket. That and nothing else. Maybe I'm a little too optimistic. Capital still has some say. So capital won't permit the taking of the profit out of the war until the people those who do the suffering and still pay the price, make up their minds that those they elect to office shall do their bidding and not that of the profiteers. Another step necessary in this fight to smash the war racket is the limited plebiscite to determine whether a war should be declared. A plebiscite not of all the voters, but merely of those who would be called upon to do the fighting and the dying. There wouldn't be very much sense in having a 76-year-old president of a munitions factory or the flat-footed head of an international banking firm or the cross-eyed manager of a uniform manufacturing plant, all of whom see visions of tremendous profits in the event of war, voting on whether the nation should go to war or not. They never would be called upon to shoulder arms to sleep in a trench and to be shot. Only those who would be called upon to risk their lives for their country should have the privilege of voting to determine whether the nation should go to war. There is ample precedent for restricting the voting to those affected. Many of our states have restrictions on those permitted to vote. In most, it is necessary to be able to read and write before you may vote. In some, you must own property. It would be a simple matter each year for the men coming of military age to register in their communities as they did in the draft during the World War and be examined physically. Those who could pass and who would therefore be called upon to bear arms in the event of war would be eligible to vote in a limited plebiscite. They should be the ones to have the power to decide and not a Congress, few of whose members are within the age limit, and fewer still of whom are in physical condition to bear arms. Only those who must suffer should have the right to vote. A third step in this business of smashing the war racket is to make certain that our military forces are truly forces for defense only. At each session of Congress, the question of further naval appropriations comes up. The swivel chair admirals of Washington, and there are always a lot of them, are very adroit lobbyists. And they are smart. They don't shout that we need a lot of battleships to war on this nation or that nation. Oh, no. 
First of all, they let it be known that America is menaced by a great naval power. Almost any day, these admirals will tell you, the great fleet of this supposed enemy will strike suddenly and annihilate 125 million people. Just like that. Then they begin to cry for a larger navy. For what? To fight the enemy? Oh my no. Oh no. For defense purposes only. Then, incidentally, they announce maneuvers in the Pacific. For defense? Uh-huh. The Pacific is a big ocean. We have a tremendous coastline on the Pacific. Will the maneuvers be off the coast two or three hundred miles? Oh no. The maneuvers will be two thousand, yes, perhaps even thirty-five hundred miles off the coast. The Japanese, a proud people, of course will be pleased beyond expression to see the United States fleet so close to Nippon's shores. Even as pleased as would be the residents of California were they to dimly discern through the morning mist the Japanese fleet playing at war games off Los Angeles. The ships of our Navy, it can be seen, should be specifically limited by law to within 200 miles of our coastline. Had that been the law in 1898, the Maine would never have gone to Havana Harbor. She never would have been blown up. There would have been no war with Spain and its attendant loss of life. 200 miles is ample in the opinion of experts for defense purposes. Our nation cannot start an offensive war if its ships can't go further than 200 miles from the coastline. Planes might be permitted to go as far as 500 miles from the coast for purposes of reconnaissance, and the army should never leave the territorial limits of our nation. To summarize, three steps must be taken to smash the war racket. 1. We must take the profit out of war. 2. We must permit the youth of the land who would bear arms to decide whether or not there should be war. 3. We must limit our military forces to home defense purposes. Chapter 5 to hell with war. I'm not a fool as to believe that war is a thing of the past. I know the people do not want war, but there is no use in saying we cannot be pushed into another war. Looking back, Woodrow Wilson was re-elected president in 1916 on a platform that he had kept us out of war, and on the implied promise that he would keep us out of war. Yet five months later, he asked Congress to declare war on Germany. In that five-month interval, the people had not been asked whether they had changed their minds. The four million young men who put on uniforms and marched or sailed away were not asked whether they wanted to go forth to suffer and die. Then what caused our government to change its mind so suddenly? money. An Allied Commission, it may be recalled, came over shortly before the war declaration and called on the President. The President summoned a group of advisers. The head of the Commission spoke. Stripped of its diplomatic language, this is what he told the President and his group. There is no use kidding ourselves any longer. The cause of the Allies are lost. We now owe you, American bankers, American munition makers, American manufacturers, American speculators, American exporters, five or six billion dollars. If we lose, and without the help of the United States we must lose, we, England, France and Italy cannot pay back this money, and Germany won't. So. Had secrecy been outlawed as far as war negotiations were concerned, and had the press been invited to be present at that conference, or had the radio been available to broadcast the proceedings, 
America never would have entered the World War. But this conference, like all war discussions, was shrouded in utmost secrecy. When our boys were sent off to war, they were told it was a war to make the world safe for democracy and a war to end all wars. Well, 18 years after, the war has less of democracy than it had then. Besides, what business is it of ours whether Russia or Germany or England or France or Italy or Austria live under democracies or monarchies? whether they are fascist or communist. Our problem is to preserve our own democracy. And very little, if anything, has been accomplished to assure us that the world war was really the war to end all wars. Yes, we have had disarmament conferences and limitations of arms conferences. They don't mean a thing. One has just failed. The results of another have been nullified. We send our professional soldiers and sailors and our politicians and our diplomats to these conferences. And what happens? The professional soldiers and sailors don't want to disarm. No admiral wants to be without a ship. No general wants to be without a command. Both mean men without jobs. They are not for disarmament. They cannot be for limitation of arms. And at all these conferences, lurking in the background but all-powerful, just the same, are the sinister agents of those who profit by war. They see to it that these conferences do not disarm or seriously limit armaments. The chief aim of any power at any of these conferences has not been to achieve disarmament to prevent war, but rather to get more armament for itself and less for any potential foe. There is only one way to disarm with any semblance of practicability. That is for all nations to get together and scrap every ship, every gun, every rifle, every tank, every warplane. Even this, if it were possible, would not be enough. The next war, according to experts, will be fought not with battleships, not by artillery, not with rifles, and not with machine guns. It will be fought with deadly chemicals and gases. Secretly, each nation is studying and perfecting newer and ghastlier means of annihilating its foes wholesale. Yes, ships will continue to be built for the shipbuilders must make their profits, and guns still will be manufactured, and powder and rifles will be made. For the munition makers must make their huge profits, and the soldiers, of course, must wear uniforms, for the manufacturer must make their war profits too. But victory or defeat will be determined by the skill and ingenuity of our scientists. If we put them to work making poison gas and more and more fiendish mechanical and explosive instruments of destruction, they will have no time for the constructive job of building greater prosperity for our peoples. By putting them to this useful job, we can all make more money out of peace than we can out of war, even the munition makers. So I say, to hell with war. End of chapter 5 End of War is a Racket by Major General Smedley Butler